Good evening on this third day of May, 19 or 2021. I am opening the council, the closed session at 4.02. And we will start with public comment then. You can, no, we will start with roll call. Okay. Mayor Hawkins. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Here. Councilmember Garaventa. Councilmember Sagerstrom. Here. And Councilmember Such. Here. So, um, Jody, let the record show that there are three council members present at this moment with um, Mayor Hawkins and Councilmember Garaventa absent. And we look forward to their prompt arrival, but in the meantime, we will take public comment. On the closed session items. Thank you, Jody. So at this time, if you have any uh, public comment on the closed session item, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature or dial star nine. If you're on a landline phone, and at this time, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any uh, public comment. Or Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, excuse me. Thank you. And if we could let the record show that Jim Garaventa has arrived. We... Thank you very much. So I'm sorry, I was watching Jim come in. Do we have no public comment? In that case, I would like to retire the meeting to closed session. Okay, everyone, we're calling the Monday, May 3rd, 2021, uh, regular Sonora City Council meeting to order at 5.02. That is an echo like none other. I'll keep that far away. So at 5.02, uh, we had a closed session. Um, item number one was we rejected the claim at 4 to 0 for uh, Ross Height. Um, no, items number two and three, we directed staff, we gave direction to staff. So at our 5 p.m. open session, Pledge of Allegiance. Doug, would you lead the pledge? Thank you, Doug. Okay, roll call, please. Mayor Hawkins. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Here. Councilmember Garaventa. Here. Councilmember Sagerstrom. Here. And Councilmember Such. Here. Okay, we have everyone here. Uh, City Clerk's report on agenda posting. The agenda was posted at 12.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 29th of May. Thank you. Okay. Approval of the agenda. Everyone, everything looks okay? Okay. Presentations. Uh, receive a Tuolumne County update from our District 1 Supervisor, David Goldenberg. Dave is on here. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so David Goldenberg, uh, District 1 Supervisor. And so I've got a few things here. Uh, COVID um, slowing down, thankfully. We're still in the orange tier. Uh, probably going to be there a little bit yet, but uh, things are looking better. We're, we're still getting some cases, but not many. Uh, that UK variant is, is still an issue. Um, hasn't really come in here in Tuolumne County, but uh, you know some areas. Mariposa had a little outbreak last week. Uh, in a church setting, uh, which ended up spreading, unfortunately, into youth sports. Uh, so that wasn't, uh, you know, good to see. So still out there, we still need to remain diligent and uh, vigilant. And, and please, uh, for those who have not uh, yet vaccinated, it truly does help. Um, there, the county's having another pod tomorrow. Uh, Pfizer is the uh, choice they're going to be using. Uh, back out at uh, Sierra Bible Church again. And um, the county with the release of J&J, &J, we do have uh, some doses of that on, on hand, and they're gonna continue to use them as they had been before. Uh, some of the 
tougher populations to get a second shot to homeless, uh, some of the jail inmates and, and other parties. A um, couple things, uh, Fire Safe Advisory Committee, we had our first meeting. This is a new committee that you may recall replaced uh, the roughly 35 member fire task force. And so it's a uh, much smaller in size, uh, more focused. Uh, had first meeting on April 28th. Um, good solid choice of uh, members that are on the committee. Uh, Chief Amy New from the city is uh, representing the city. Um, be making recommendations to the board of supervisors and at a high level, we started out uh, looking at communications, education, outreach, uh, governance is something we're looking at, including, you know, possible vegetation ordinance at some point, and uh, emergency planning, emphasis on looking at escape routes, uh, shelter in place, other considerations. Um, I have been meeting with uh, Sheriff Pooley, as well as uh, we've got a, a lot of different county staff and people from outside the county GIS staff uh, starting to work on that project. Next meeting will be June 23rd. Uh, we are, the committee is meeting in person, but the public uh, not in person, but can join via Zoom. Um, Emergency Operations Center, we had a pre-fire season exercise uh, last week on Friday out at uh, Stryker Court, the EOC out there, the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, Dory Beats, our county OES coordinator, you know, kind of managed that. Uh, uh, board Chair Ryan Campbell and myself were there. Um, and again, uh, Sonora City Chief uh, Amy New was in attendance and spoke. A um, few updates, CAL FIRE Unit Chief Nick Cashy updated, uh, talked a little bit about the fuel moisture conditions. Uh, you know, they had a fire out in Calaveras County, about 160 acres last week. And I think people uh, saw how well that burned. Well, a lot of that is the fuel moistures are very low. They're at about levels that would normally be expected the end of June, early July. So when, when you see the brush being consumed as cleanly as it was on that fire, that's worrisome. Uh, Cal Fire did uh, just get approval budget uh, for the Tuami Calaveras unit. They hired 80 additional firefighters. That's very good. It, it helps staff up some extra areas, especially with the loss of baseline camp, because uh, some of those will be uh, hand crews. Um, the fallout of that, unfortunately, is our local fire districts and uh, including the US Forest Service. And I don't know about the city if they've been affected, but uh, we, a lot of firefighters that were volunteers or resident firefighters got hired by CAL FIRE, thus drawing them away and, and leaving us short on, on volunteers. So we're, we're trying to figure out uh, the best ways to manage that issue. Um, Stanislaus National Forest Supervisor, uh, Jason Kuyken, uh provided an update as well. And on, on the forest side, having that shortage of firefighters uh, means that they're gonna have difficulty staffing up some of their fire engines this year. Uh, he anticipated as of last week that he would only be able to staff eight of 12 engines. So that's, a, that's not a good uh, position to be in. Uh, there was also presentations by the National Weather Service, OES, and PGE. Uh, county budget, like uh, many entities in the city, we're still waiting on uh, the American Rescue Plan to see what happens there. It was originally signed by President Biden on May 11th, so they were supposed to have 60 days to get the funds out to the uh, uh, counties and cities. So we hope to see that happening pretty quick here. Uh, also waiting on guidance on, on how we're going to be allowed to utilize those funds. County's currently taking a really hard look at all county properties, especially lease properties, to see what we can do uh, to get out of some of these lease agreements with the new courthouse opening. Uh, we'll have some opportunities to shift some programs around. Uh, as they move out, we might move, uh, this was in the paper, we might move the board of supervisors over into the old courthouse, bring our IT in here. Uh, a lot of these things are, you know, lease space. IT is costing the county 150,000 a year in lease space. And our public health and uh, areas out there off of uh, Cedar Road, off of Cabazoo, 
uh, all of that complex is costing about 450,000 a year. So we're looking at moving those folks into TGF, but we've got to do some remodeling there. Uh, libraries, uh, good news on libraries. Uh, you know, the, they're opening up more. The main branch is open now Monday through Friday, 10 to four. Uh, Tuolumne and Twain Hart, Tuesday to Thursday, two to 6 p.m. Uh, Friday and Saturday, they just added 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So they're still working on the bookmobile, uh, still trying to resolve some staffing issues. Um, a big thing that came out from uh, Cole Prisbella uh, this week uh, was that the uh, Small Business Administration uh, on the federal level is opening up a new program uh, regarding restaurant revitalization funding. And they actually started accepting applications today. There's gonna be an SBA uh, webinar uh, this Thursday. And so you can get a hold of Cole uh, to inquire about that more. Uh, his cell number is 209-288-4030. Um, like I say, they're, they're, from what I've seen of this, this could be very, very positive for our restaurants because they're, they're explaining that uh, they can actually make up lost revenue uh, through this program. So we don't know the details yet, but uh, would highly encourage uh, the restaurants to be looking at this, it could it could be a, a, a real good thing for them. Other than that, um, I did launch my website for supervisor, uh, supervisordavidgoldenberg.com. I uh, encourage you to take a look. Um, I'll be scheduling office hours on Thursdays from 1 to 3 p.m., 30 minute uh, increments. You can schedule through my website or call me directly. My office phone is 209 Five three three five five seven two, and there is a link to that uh, SBA restaurant session in the calendar on my website as well. So that's pretty much all I got. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the council if you have some. Anyone having questions? Okay. Anne says, "Great report." Thank you. Glad glad to be able to provide it. Well, Dave, thank you, and thank you for uh, continuing to keep your promise and working with the city so diligently. Absolutely. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Okay, item number five, introduction and swearing in of police officer Antonio Schaus. Antonio Schaus accepted for this position back in May of 2019. Came out number one on the list. Uh, however, the hiring practice, uh, process was put on hold due to six months. Once he returned from overseas, we completed the hiring process, hired him as a police trainee, and sponsored him as a cadet at the Contra Costa County Law Enforcement Academy. He started the academy on October 5th and graduated with flying colors on April 9th of this year. So Antonio began his law enforcement journey by enlisting in the California Air National Guard in 2014 as a security forces airman. Uh, that's the Air Force designation for military police. Uh, he still serves on the reserve, as a reserve status with the 129th Security Forces Squadron based out of Mountain View. During his time in the military, he achieved the rank of Staff Sergeant. He certified as a patrol supervisor. He deployed to Kuwait and was selected as Airman of the Year in 2019. Over the past six years, Antonio has also dedicated at least one uh, weekend a month to volunteer with a youth program at Camp Parks in Dublin, working with kids from the ages of 13 to 17 and teaching them skills related to the military. He has mentored over 100 young men and women and provided them with skills they can carry on with them for the rest of their lives. Antonio hopes to carry on similar volunteer work here with the youth in Sonora. Antonio's father and grandparents have lived in Tuolumne County for 20 years and have been residents of our city for the past seven years. 
Antonio considers it a privilege to have called Sonora his home away from home for the better part of his life and is now excited to call Sonora his new home. He is greatly appreciative of the opportunity to serve this amazing community as a police officer with the Sonora Police Department. Um, uh, before I do the oath, if it's all right, Mr. Mayor, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Lemus as uh, our, our CSO and then provide the oath at, at the same time. Sounds good to me. All right. If I could have you step over here, Mr. Schaus. Jolene, step forward. So Jolene Lemus tested for the position of community service officer in August of last year and was hired in March. She has been in the field training program since then and she's doing a great job. Jolene was born in Fremont, raised in Modesto. She moved to Tuolumne County in 2013 with her then fiance, and they were married in 2014. The couple then welcomed their son in 2017, who was a sixth generation Tuolumne County resident. Jolene has visited the area throughout her life and has many fond memories, including summer camping with her father around the Pinecrest area. For over six years, Jolene worked as a caregiver for the elderly at various assisted living facilities and describes this line of work as both an honor and a very rewarding uh, profession. She enjoys animals as well and has had the opportunity to cultivate her passion for them while working as a veterinary assistant for a local vet hospital. Jolene enjoys fishing, camping, and hiking with her husband and son. She also devotes much of her time to painting, photographing nature, and sketching, but still makes time to be home with her family. Jolene has always looked for ways to better herself and her community and is willing to help out in any way she can. And she believes the CSO position is a way for her to do just that. She looks forward to learning everything she can about the position and hopes to, I'm sorry, hopes that her upbeat, positive and friendly attitude will serve her well in this capacity. So at this point, if I could have both Mr. Schaus, Ms. Lima, um, I'm yeah, sorry. Can we have them stand from the bear? Well, yeah, right now, sure. Right, right over here. Okay. Wherever you want them. Yeah, turn around. We're going to turn around and first. Yeah, we, we're, kind of, we're kind of working on this. Are we good? So, Tom, so yeah, Tom, yeah. All right, take take a half a step away from each other. All right, you both raise your hand, repeat after me. I state your name. Do solemnly swear. To support and defend. Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now we're better true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation. Perfect evasion. And I will faithfully discharge the duties on which I'm about to enter. Yeah. All right, so what I'm going to do is have uh, Ms. Lima stand over here. And uh, I have uh, Antonio's mother. Where's she at? There she is. Stacy, she's going to have the honor of pinning the badge tonight. So if we can get the cameras ready. For a photo op, press hard. You don't want it to fall out. Introducing Officer Antonio Schaus. Congratulations. Microphone. <laughs> just wanted to say thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. Sorry for my voice; recently lost it, but uh, I just want to say thank you, and I uh, very much appreciate this. Thank you. We look forward to having you. All right. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, uh, Jolene's husband Zach couldn't make it tonight. He was going to pin her badge, but. Uh, I guess the lieutenant has the honor tonight. Where is she at? There she is. All right. We're going to step up here and we'll get a photo off of that as well. Oops. 
All right, it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce community service officer, Jolene Lemus. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. You okay, next is public comment on non-agenda items. The public may address the council on any item of public interest, not otherwise on the agenda that is within the jurisdiction of the city. No action can be taken. Matters to be addressed may be referred to city staff or placed on a subsequent meeting agenda. Speakers are limited to a three minute presentation and this is for non-agenda items. Um, again, if you have public comment for non-agenda items, um, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature, or if you're on a, a phone line, please dial star nine to be able to raise your hand. At this time, Mr. Mayor, your first public comment speaker is Karen Wood. Oh, excellent. Go ahead, Karen. Hey, Karen, so you're we can't. Muted. Sorry. Yep, sorry. Um, we are a community of predominantly white, heterosexual, able bodied, cisgender people. So many of us would default to the belief that it is fine that our leaders and decision makers should all be the same as us. I challenge you to think of this differently. Yes, we are predominantly a community of white, heterosexual, able bodied, cisgender people, but we are not 100% that way. And we do not live in a bubble that no one else enters. If you truly believe as elected officials in the recently adopted value statement that states we value our city's social and racial diversity and our commitment to protection, safety, prosperity, and a sense of belonging for all, then our decision makers should be representative of all people in our community. We need to step away from percentages and who has the most and look at who is the all in this value statement. Even if there is only one black person in our community, that black person's voice should be valued and heard, just as all voices should be valued and heard. In order to honor the commitment made in this value statement, it is imperative that you as elective members of the city council have committees, councils, and commissions that include and honor the diversity of Sonora. In order to ensure that our diversity is honored, it is imperative that all appointments to committees, councils, and commissions be accountable to the public, transparent, inclusive, and collaborative. The current process of appointing members to all bodies is insular, closed, and exclusive. Sections 2.06 and 2.32 of the Municipal Code gives all power to the mayor with no requirements on how to appoint people. He is not required to consider all applicants. He is not required to use a standard interview process of ask, asking each applicant the same questions. He is not required to even share the questions he asked or the criteria used to select the candidates. If the value statement that was adopted at the last meeting is truly the direction we want the leadership of our community to go, then the process of appointing people who will influence our council members must guarantee a broader stage of people to be appointed to allow for the needs and the voices of all people to be represented. We cannot trust that every mayor that has this power will be committed to being socially equitable and will not only honor the adopted value statement, but will honor all members of our community, creating a process that is accountable to the people, seconds. transparent and consistent across applicants, inclusive of not only other decision makers, but of the community and collaborative to allow for discussions on who the stakeholders are and if they're being represented, regardless of who our mayor is. Sonora's appointment process will become socially equitable. We will achieve better outcomes by engaging and including all people continuously and meaningful and maximize for all the right to protection, safety, prosperity, and a sense of belonging. Thank you. Your time's up, Karen. Thank you. Mayor, your next public speaker is Megan Mills. Megan Mills, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, Megan Mills, she, her pronouns. Um, at the city council meeting of April 19th, 2021, during public comment around the issue of keeping the social equity committee as a function of the city council, there were 17 speakers from the community. 
16 out of the 17 spoke in support of the committee remaining under the purview of the Sonora City Council. Following public comment during discussion, Mayor Pro Tem Plummer stated, and I quote, as a partisan myself, when I see the makeup of almost everybody commenting on this, they all look like very eager partisans. And I personally am unable to separate what is, what appears to be a partisan position to strengthen party from just good human nature, unquote. I would like to ask Mayor Pro Tem Plummer what he meant by that statement. Exactly what does a partisan look like? With differences of race, gender, sexual orientation, and age across the 17 community members who spoke that evening, how did Mr. Plummer determine that these folks all looked partisan? This statement is not only dismissive of the lived experiences voiced by the community members who had just spoken, it also reflects what I see as a deeply problematic barrier to unbiased governance that is held by the mayor pro tem. I would ask that this concern be addressed by the council and ask if the community will hold Mayor Pro Tem accountable for these statements as they reflect a rigid stance against the progress of the Social Equity Committee. To members of the public, you can reference the recording during which these statements were made on the City Council website where the comments occur at the two hour and 24 minute mark. Thank you for listening to my comments. Just so you know, Ms. Mills, um... Uh, the mayor pro tem is actually not allowed at this time to comment on any issues that are coming up. So I would highly encourage anyone with any questions for myself or council member such or mayor pro tem, anyone on this council to reach out and call us or email. Um, I know everyone on this council is pretty reachable. So. Uh, Mr. Mayor, next public speaker is David Chichenall. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Hold on, David. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hey, uh, I'm just uh, uh, wanted to speak tonight about I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I sent in a uh, letter talking about my group wanting to provide at no charge to the city. Uh, we also made the same offer to the county constitutional training, and I'd like to institutionalize that so that maybe every uh, public employee who has to take the oath of office could get that training on the two year anniversary of their employment date. You know, uh, I don't think anybody in, in that room there, I certainly wouldn't do it myself. I would never uh, sign a contract or agree to a contract if I didn't know what was in it. Yet, uh, when you take it, uh, an oath to, the, uh, to defend the state of California and the United States Constitution, you are indeed entering into a contract. And that contract is with the electorate, the people who are your boss and, and yourself. And so it just, it, to me, you really should have more training. Uh, I know that police officers get very little training uh, when they're going through their post and nothing, uh, not much of it goes on. And I don't think public employees get any training whatsoever. I, uh, all the time, I always ask people, can you name the uh, five rights contained within the first amendment? And I usually can't get anybody to answer that question at all because they always uh, forget one two or three of those rights at least so i just wanted to bring that up again that i do have that offer out there i haven't uh, heard from anybody yet would like to hear something back either uh, uh, yeah we'd like to look at this or uh negative thanks but no thanks so i'll just bring that up and maybe uh, one of you can correspond with me via the same email that i sent the letter in uh, to begin with but that's all i have to say thank you dave Mr. Mayor, your next public speaker is LaDonica. LaDonica, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. At the last city council meeting, Mayor Hawkins appointed three new members to the city planning commission. There were nine applicants and only four were interviewed for that appointment. Thank you for, the, thank you for that transparency. Mayor Hawkins, you mentioned that you did your due diligence when appointing these members. I would like more transparency in how that was accomplished. I'm sure the five applicants that you did not speak to would also like to know. From what I understand from the last meeting, there will be more discussion about how appointments are made. My hope is that you all, including the committee and commission, put on your social equity lens when making any decisions for the city as you move forward. Also, Mayor Hawkins, at the last meeting, you mentioned you had 20 to 25 years of hiring experience. 
that's a lot of experience. However, I challenge you to look at where you can be more socially equitable in the appointment process, one being looking at all applicants. My hope is that you will be curious enough to look into what it means to appoint or hire with a social equity lens. There are many resources out there that you can draw from. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to seeing the City Council adopt more social and racial equitable practices in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, LaDonica. Uh, Mr. Mayor, your next public speaker is Pablo Lopez. Pablo. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess in line with the previous comments, um, I think there's just questions and concerns regarding um, you know, certain appointments and the the, um, the reasoning behind uh, the choosing of the certain appointments. So I think moving forward, um, I have a concern regarding council member Jim Garavanta leaving and the process by which his replacement will be chosen. Um, again, I think there's a call from the community looking for more transparency, um, perhaps more um, discussion from other council members and more input. Um, I think we're all asking, you know, what's that going to look like in the future? Can we create a criterion that's more expansive, that's more transparent, that's more accessible to the community? Um, and, you know, we hope that um, it goes that way. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Is there anyone else? At this time, Mr. Mayor, I don't see any additional public comment. Excellent. Okay, on to this consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered routine and we vote, voted on in one motion unless a council member or members of the public has a question or wishes to discuss an item. In that case, item will be removed for the consent calendar considered separately. Council members, is there anything you'd like to have removed or considered separately from the consent calendar? Okay. Yes, we are looking for a motion and a second on the consent calendar. Are you new public first? Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading a couple of these, but yeah. Uh, is there any public comment on the consent calendar? Again, if you have any public comment for the consent calendar, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature. Or if you're on a phone line, please dial star nine. And at this time, Mr. Mayor, I do not see a public comment for consent. Okay. Okay, now we'll move to approve the consent calendar. Second. <clears throat> okay, motion by Council Member Garavena, second by Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Roll we'll call vote, please. Mayor Hawkins. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Aye. Council Member Garaventa. Aye. Council Member Sagerstrom. Aye. And Council Member Such. Aye. Excellent. Carries five to zero. Public hearings. Item number 10. Motion to approve first reading introduction of ordinance number 878. Reading by title only, waiving further reading and ordinance of the, Sonora, uh, the City Council uh, of the City of Sonora approving the development agreement by and between the City of Sonora and Hazy Bulldog Farms, LLC. Mary Rose. Mr. Mayor, um, Council members, the item before you is um, asking for the first reading and introduction of Ordinance 878 and also approvement of development agreement by and between the City of Sonora and Hazy Bulldog Farms, LLC. Um, if you recall, on November 16, 2020, the City Council adopted Ordinance 873, which amended the Cannabis Business Pilot Program and changed how cannabis dispensaries operated within the City of Sonora to allow for recreational adult use cannabis. On March 15, 2021, the City Council adopted Ordinance 877, which allowed Hazy Bulldog to expand their operations to include the sale of adult use cannabis at their current site, which is at... 1201 Mono Way in the city of Sonora. You approved a first amendment to that development agreement on March 15th. Currently, Hazy Bulldog, which is to expand to an additional site on 1243 Mono Way. With this new site, the previous site, 1201 Mono Way, will hence close once the opening of that new site will, um, if, if and when the city council approves this the development agreement. So the item before you is asking to, uh, to approve this new development agreement for this new site. And there are some additional modifications to the development agreement um, prior or um, that were added on the original development agreement at that current site 1201 mono way and i'll just kind of go over what those new requirements are on this new development agreement. So 
So in your current agreement that um, the council um, approved back in March um, and in 2018, um, the public benefit fee is at 10,000 um, a month or 5% of gross sales. Your new development agreement, which will allow for the recreational adult use cannabis would expand the public benefit fee to $12,500 a month or 7.5% of gross receipts from the operation, whichever is greater um, in a month. It would also require that once the full opening of that new site is opened, the development agreement would cease to exist on the prior um, 1201 mono way. So you've got those two additional modifications where you've got the expansion of the public benefit fee, which, it, which includes to increase it to 12,500 a month or seven and a half percent, which is ever greater. Um, and then you also have the assurance that once this new site is uh, fully opened, that prior original agreement will cease to um, exist. On April 12, 2021, your Sonora Planning Commission approved resolution 04-12-21A and recommended that the city adopt the first amendment to, or excuse me, that they adopt the amendment to the, or excuse me, the development agreement by and between the city of Sonora and Hazy Bulldog. And that resolution of the Planning Commission is part of your packet as well. So at this time, I'll entertain any additional comments I know it's a little bit confusing because we've had multiple items coming from Hazy Bulldog. So I just wanted to uh, kind of put it into perspective. You approved in March a first amendment to their current development agreement. Um, that is for a different location. This development agreement is for a new location. Once that, adult, once that site is fully operational, that um, first amendment and development agreement that you approved back in March will cease to exist and this new development agreement will stand if and when the council approves um, this, this development agreement in front of you. Okay, any council member questions or comments at this time? Um, if uh, the council wants to um, modify the agreement in any way, they, um... the uh, monthly, um payments uh, of fee payments or percentages or something like that. Um, uh, what, uh, how is that? You would have to go all the way back to the planning commission and go through public hearing in the planning commission before it would be brought back to the city council. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then I guess we will go to public comment. At this time, if there's any public comment for this public hearing item, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature, or if you're on a phone line, please dial star nine um, using uh, on your phone. At this time, Mr. Mayor, there is a uh, public comment from Bob and I believe it's Bob Kirk. Excellent, go ahead, Bob. Okay, um, between the planning commission and city council, it's amazing how many meetings have been held on this topic. Equally amazing is how many people have spoken up against it and been totally ignored. What a waste of time. But it's never a waste of time to take a stand to protect our youth. And for that, I applaud the over 60 people who have spoken up against this scourge. The city should have done an analysis of the pilot program results. Instead, you are forging ahead with no analysis, no business plan, no public outreach, and essentially no public input. Intrinsically, you probably understand the market size is limited and are raising the fees accordingly. 12.5K per month for three stores equates to 450K per year. That's probably enough money to cover the cost of five or six employees. Is that what this is all about? When the second and third storefronts come online, they're going to be competing over the same customer base. So the store's profit margin will take a hit, but the city will still get its money. From what I've heard, customers are flocking to Oakdale and Riverbank for much lower prices. Raise the fees, drive prices up, and drive customers to the neighboring county. Oh, and did I mention this will raise prices for medicinal customers? And probably drive them away also. Oh, and did I mention rising prices always makes more headroom for the black market to thrive? Back to our youth, digging into the state of Florida, Child Abuse Death Review Committee Annual Report, December 2020, you will find one third of child deaths are drug related and a whopping 77% of those deaths were associated with marijuana use. 
Things like parents too stoned to know they've rolled over on their sleeping child. Parents too stoned to close the gate to the swimming pool. State of Texas, Department of Family and Protective Services, fiscal year 2018, child maltreatment facilities and fatalities and near fatalities annual report shows active drug use by the caregiver in 72% of child deaths. 45% of those deaths involve marijuana use. Marijuana is the number one drug associated with children's death. Marijuana storefronts are clearly detrimental to health, safety, 30 seconds, and general wel welfare. Please vote no. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bob. And again, if there is any additional comment on this public hearing, please raise your hand using the um, raise your hand feature or star nine on your phone. And at this time, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any additional public comment. Okay. Um, oh, excuse we'll, me, we'll, I'm sorry. One just rose, raised their hand. I wanna make sure we get this person, Mr. Mayor. Is that the 1626, if your yes, number sir. ends if, and, yep. If you are on, uh, last four digits, 1626, please dial star six to unmute yourself. <clears throat> Go ahead. Is it okay? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is David Peters. I've made comments before. In fact, I'd like to apologize for the tone in which I made them and when Hazy Bulldog was giving contribution to the county while it was being considered while their application was being considered. Uh, that's uncalled for. However, having said that, um, I think that the council should know that we're not gonna give up on this ever uh, and we'll use any methods we can uh, in a civil and, and I almost said progressive, in a progressive way to um, uh, stop these kind of things and whether it's uh, running people for election or recalls or whatever, whatever is available to us. Also, I would really like to encourage the uh, council. I was delayed, so I just got recently here. I don't know if anybody said it, but uh, it would be great to have public, actual public meetings again. I know the county is allowing those now. Uh, and that gives us a chance, especially those of us who are um, have problems with technology, uh, getting on and saying something is, is difficult for a lot of people, so it disenfranchises them. So if that can be done, we would greatly appreciate that. But I did want to uh, let the, the council know that uh, this isn't going to go away. We're going to fight every single application and do everything in our power to head this stuff off because the morality of the county can't just be, or the city can't just be uh, finances. It also has to involve character, morality, and the, the past teaching that we've given to our children in regards to this problem. And I'd really like to see some education. The board, the, the council promised to uh, uh, put money out for education against marijuana uh, as a condition for for one of the council members voting for it. And I think that should be followed through with. We haven't heard anything on that, as well as we haven't heard anything uh, from uh, from the council on, uh, this was a pilot project. Seconds. We've never heard an evaluation on the pilot projects yet. And so going ahead with it without the, the evaluation doesn't seem uh, like it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peters. I thought I saw a hand up a minute ago, but I don't see it now. I did, I thought it was... Um... Pa Pablo, did you take your hand down? I, don't, I wanna make sure we don't skip over him. I guess, I guess so, I guess he took his hand uh, down. Yeah, wow. sorry, I, I was an accident. Oh, okay. Okay, so if there are no more hands raised, we'll bring it back to the council. Um, something I did want to bring up, Mr. Peters brought up, there was a part that at one point the council had made a commitment for education, but we had to bring it up for a later vote. 
and that was voted on was it right around the first meeting in april i believe so Mr. okay yeah it was voted on the first meeting in april and i actually couldn't attend the meeting but it was voted two to two two against two four two for it two against it my understanding um so it, it basically died of a lack of a vote it, Councilmember Sagas room. Funds dedicated to education that was um, that was under discussion and was uh, uh, was the bone of contention. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I wasn't at the meeting. I've, I've heard things, but it, it really I'm, I wasn't at the meeting, unfortunately. So. Okay. Any other council member comments? That's my research. I know this isn't agendized, but I would um, like to request that the education conversation comes back to the council um, to talk about the percentage and also potential programs to spend the money on. Mm, okay. Yeah, I'll have to get with right. uh, Doug and Mary Rose about the, the legality of it since it's been voted down already. So. It wasn't voted down. It was just a two-two vote. Okay. Like I said, I'll I'll get with Doug and we'll go from there. And so, okay. Any other council member comments? So no one's. <laughs> I right. expected more discussion and more hands raised. So, um, I I'm guess I'll for a motion. I'm just waiting. Yeah. If no one else has any discussion. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and move to waive the first reading and uh, introduce, uh, move to approve. Oh, okay, I got to read it <laughs> verbatim here. I wasn't exactly how I had it in in my mind. So I move to approve the approve first reading and introduction of ordinance number 878, reading by title only, waiving further reading, an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Sonora to approve the development agreement by and between the City of Sonora and Hazy Bulldog Farms, LLC. I will second that. Okay. So motion by Council Member Garaventa, second by Mayor Pretend Plummer. Okay, roll call vote, please. Mayor Hawkins. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Aye. Council Member Garaventa. Aye. Council Member Sagerstrom. Aye. Council Member Such. No. Okay, passes four to one. Okay, so. And I don't think um, Council Member Sagerstrom's mic was on, but I just want to make sure that her vote was registered as an aye. Just for the public. I did vote, yes. Okay, so um, under public hearings, item number 11, motion to approve first reading introduction of order or ordinance number 879, reading by title only, waive, waiving further reading and ordinance of the uh, city council of the city of Sonora, approving the first amendment to the development agreement by and between the city of Sonora and Brack House LLC. Mary Rose. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, on August 5th, 2019, the City Council adopted Ordinance 858, which approved the development agreement um, to op for Bracht House LLC um, for them to operate a medicinal cannabis dispensary business on 10 Calavera Street in the City of Sonora. And that was on August 5th, 2019. The item before you is approving a First Amendment to that development agreement. Um, based on the council's adoption of Ordinance 873, um, Bracht House wishes to expand their operations to include the sale of adult use cannabis at that site at 10 Calaveras um, Street. <clears throat> and um, with the proposed amendment revises the original agreement to allow them to obtain a A-type license for sale of adult use recreational cannabis. Again, as with your Hazy Bulldog um, amendments and with the new development agreement, there are revisions to the First Amendment um, uh, to the original agreement. The amendment revises the public benefit fee that Bracht House would pay. The public benefit fee is the amount the developer uses to offset the impact, as we talked about, of cannabis business 
purposes. Again, um, with adult recreational cannabis, um, the developer has agreed um, to pay a public benefit fee of $12,500 each month or 7.5% of gross receipts from operations, whichever is greater. And with Bracked House, there is an additional caveat that we put into their first amendment. Um, although um, Brecht House has had a um, approved development agreement and use permit um, since August of 2019, their site has never been fully developed for sale of, of cannabis. So in regards to ensuring that that site becomes developed, because we do have an interest, uh, many interest businesses of cannabis to um, operate within the city of Sonora, we wanted to ensure that this developer um, opens a business within the city of Sonora. With that in mind, the additional caveat that we have with this in the agreement that, that Bracked House would pay starting May 1st, which was on Saturday, 10,000 a month to the city of Sonora until their um, site becomes fully operational, at which time when they are fully operational, then they will um, bump that public benefit fee up to 12,500. As of today, um, Bracked House has begun that payment, so they are in compliance with that. Um, we also have an additional caveat that they must be fully operational and opening within six months of the signing of this development agreement to ensure that they um, become into compliance with the development agreement. So at this time, I will entertain any questions from the council. Yeah, I, I don't have any questions. Does any of the council have any questions? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a goodwill gesture to ensure that they develop. Well, yes, because they have to do construction. So there is um, an amount of construction time that we are giving them. Um, they will be required under the terms of this agreement if the council so chooses to approve this agreement that they will pay that that 10,000 a month until they are fully operational um, and then at which time that public benefit fee will jump up to 12,500 and they are in agreement with those terms. So I presume that for a third applicant, that would also include that type of language for performance a little earlier on than we were successful with Bracked House. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so we will ask for public comment on this item. At this time, if you have public comment on this uh, public hearing item, Please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if you're on a phone line. And at this time, Mr. Mayor, we have um, Mr. Bob Kirk again um, for, with public comment, sir. Go ahead, Bob, we're definitely listening. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. Hold on just a second, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, I think we, there we go. Um, one of the city's rules about marijuana storefronts is the use is not located within 600 feet of a school, youth center, daycare, church, or park. Uh, Tuolumne County has their youth and family visitation center at 101 Hospital Road. That is about 200 feet away from the 10 Calavera Street location. A youth and family visitation center is not compatible with the marijuana storefront business. That center is a place where the damage caused by adverse childhood experiences known as ACEs is being worked out. In case you didn't know, parents smoking pot and doing drugs is a leading cause of ACEs. The Youth and Family Visitation Center opened in January of 2017. That's a full two and a half years before the city entertained a development agreement with Bracked House in July of 2019. According to the city's rules, this development agreement is not valid. And to just go on here, many people in the community have expressed their concern about how increasing the availability of marijuana will lead to increased youth access, no matter how hard you try to regulate it. In Colorado, past month use by youth age 12 to 17 increased by 30% since recreational marijuana legalization. Maybe that's why 80% of California municipalities ban recreational sales, the complete opposite of Prop 64 results. You say you can regulate storefronts in a way that prevents youth access and diminishes the black market. Experience in Colorado and California shows the black market just grows bigger. The reason is simple. Easier community access gets more kids hooked. 
Once hooked, kids don't want to pay the high prices for regulated products. They just want it cheap and they don't care where it comes from. One of the more insidious products sold in recreational pot shops are gummy bear candies. Consuming a single laced gummy bear can have lifelong impacts on a young child. For you who say it's not about money, it's about freedom. The city's actions say otherwise. So far, the city hasn't even granted one penny of marijuana tax revenue to youth education, and it's not even on the agenda, even when you are receiving 900K in American Rescue Plan funding. How about saying no kids items for sale in the store? We're talking about- 30 seconds. We're talking about so-called adult use, right? So why can't you restrict gummy bears, vaping products, and other products targeting youth? Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. At this time, if you have any additional public comment for this public hearing item, please raise your hand. And I just wanted to wait just a second, Mr. Mayor, to make sure, yes. Uh, we do have an additional public comment from a phone line, 1620. Can you please dial star six to unmute yourself? I believe that's uh, David Peters. Yes, sir. 1626, excuse me. 1626, dial star six to unmute yourself. No. Mr. Peters, if you want to dial star six to unmute yourself. Star six. He's still muted, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so Mr. Peters, if you can hear us, star six will unmute. Still muted, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Well, I think we're gonna have to continue going. I was trying to give it time. I understand there are issues with phones and that sort of thing. So, okay, so I will bring it back to the council. Yep, I will bring it back to the council and council member Segestrom. Okay, uh, could we have um, clarification um, about the uh, allegation of uh, where this is located versus the Youth and Family Visitation Center? Sure, so um, this was actually brought up during the Planning Commission as well at the time, and I know um, your legal counsel can also um, talk to this as well. At the time, Nubia Goldstein, our Deputy City Attorney, stated that that type of facility is not considered a daycare center, which is... Um, what the um, prohibition is at 600 feet in regards to that type of facility. So um, it, that type of facility and behavioral health, whatever they have, is not considered a daycare center. Also at the time that the council approved the 2019 development agreement, um, there was no comment from behavioral health um, that there was a, what do they call it, a visitation center? Um, and there was no objection from behavioral health at that time in 2019. The city does not have the ability to monitor the uses of public buildings. We don't have the ability to regulate what they do in their public buildings. So unless they tell us what's going on in their buildings, we don't know what's actually happening. Um, and so at that time there was not, um, in 2019, there was no objection from the county for the use um, of um, a cannabis dispensary at 10 Calavera Street. And again, Doug, if you wanna expand, but Nubia had stated at the Planning Commission that that type of facility was not in line with the use of a daycare center. Well, I just, you know, have, I have a building in my mind and I, uh, I just can't, um, I, I don't know where the, the other building is, but it seemed to me that there was nothing that was like 200 feet away from it. So, yeah. So so, so if I could, um, I think the easiest way to deal with this is just to read what's actually in the state code. So, okay. uh, so for the health and safety code defines a youth center to, as any public or private facility that is primarily used to host recreational or social activities for minors, including but not limited to pri private youth membership organizations or clubs, social ser service, teenage club facilities, video arcades, or similar amusement park facilities. Um, this does not appear to meet that definition in the code. 
um, nor were we made aware of it or was it brought to our attention even during um, our, re our review of it when it was first um, uh, um, approved. Uh, at this point in time, this is an entitled use for um, at least medicinal um, uh, cannabis. And so um, those objections would have had, had to be made timely at that point in time so they could have been considered and they were not provided to us. Anyone else? Oh, Council Member Sedge. <clears throat> has behavioral health commented on this or is it the public? Uh, Council Member Sedge, not to my knowledge, I have not received any comment from behavioral health. And I will just check with your community development department. Okay. Thank you. Not and we didn't receive it in the first round either. So yeah. thanks. So real quickly, what exactly does this center do? It's do we know this behavioral health center? I, I'm not entirely sure because behavioral health has not reached out to oh, us to let right. us know what it is, but um, I believe it's a visitation <laughs> center. So <laughs> That was cool. Uh, Sorry, move. <laughs> so I believe there's a, I'm not entirely sure um, because I'm not familiar with behavioral health services, sure. mm -hmm. um, but it, it is a visitation center for those that are within the behavioral health system of care. And well, just like to meet with family and- Yes. Yeah. And so just to be- um, Okay, go ahead. Clear, even if it wasn't, even if that was the case, when you look at what the definition of youth center is, it wouldn't fall within that definition. Right. Um, so. No, I was just trying to get in my mind what the actual function of the use of the facility is. Um, and I would assume it's pretty controlled. Um, so, uh, and set on certain grounds, not overflowing into off property. I would think it'd be a very controlled uh, situation. For our city attorney, thank you. For our city attorney, it's reasonable to expect that if the county had had or had any concerns, this has been before the planning commission and everything for years now that they would have contacted us. Is that a reasonable assumption? Yeah, that's what we expect, or even members of the public. I mean, when it was originally entitled the first time around. So yeah. this is this is something that is new in this consideration. So okay. thank you very much. That's anyone else. Okay, so yeah, for the public's uh, benefit, and Doug, maybe you can um, explain a little bit. Maybe not going into super big detail. Um, basically how a development agreement works. I, I've explained it several times, but I, I, I think there's a few people maybe on here that don't, you know, that they, this first time tuning in or whatever, that they may, may not understand how a development agreement works. Um, yeah, so a development agreement, particularly in the cannabis context, um, it's, it's, part, it's one part of what is a multi-layered onion. Um, the development agreement really serves as the conduit where we have the contractual relationship with the, um, developer and the operator um, of the property and lay out kind of our expectations, both in terms of what their the expectation is that they're going to give back in terms of form of a public benefit, uh, but some other details. But because it's a contractual remedy, and if we were to ever get litigation with them, it would take several years to, to get resolution to it. We couple that with a conditional use permit that we can um, effectively revoke if they're not in compliance with their development agreement within 30 days. That's all backstopped with ultimately a tax as well. Um, so there's there's three layers to the onion, all serving very unique and specific purposes. But this is the one that allows us to, to really uh, memorialize more the contractual relationships to give us um, the flexibility to work with them to kind of um, carve out what's in the best interest of the community from, from several different standpoints, as opposed to, you know, your sign can be this big and it has to be this far away. and that kind of thing that would come through, like for instance, a conditional use permit. Essentially, basically they go and for in layman's terms, they basically go and screw up something in the, in the contract. Whereas maybe a normal business would open up, it would take a number of steps. In this case, we could almost pull it, but it pull their, their ability to be able to sell. But also in the same uh, way, 
we have to meet certain standards for them. And again, this is all transparent for the public. Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest way to think about it is a development agreement is your contract gives you the ability if they break it to get attorney's fees back, which is something you don't get when you go down the permit route. The CUP is your permit. And then the tax is just what it, you know, what it is. It's a backstop of, of, of what somebody has to pay. So this is our contractual arrangement coupled with a permit arrangement, but this gives us the ability to get attorney's fees, a whole bunch of other things when people don't abide by our expectations of them that are laid out and memorialized uh, in a contract form that's, that's voted on and approved by this council and whoever the end operator is. Excellent, thank you. Just for the public's knowledge, they do, they do, or and, and they will, and have received like regular police visits and fire visits, that sort of thing. So um, everything is done in an extremely legal way. So, yeah, regular audits. I mean, it's 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 not something where it pops up and we forget about them and stand with a a golden pot collecting money. Um, it's something that there's there's more into it than just that. So if there's no other council discussion, I'll look for a motion in a second, I guess. Oh, council member Such. I just um, want to say that my no votes are not a vote against recreational marijuana. They're a vote against um, the lack of a reasonable and adequate funding source for education. So I just wanted to make that clear. And I would like to circle back to um, Colette Such's um, request to agendize um, the education element, uh, which we felt was severely underfunded um, in the last um, discussion. Thank and you. And like I said, I'll, I will discuss it with uh, Mr. White, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> so, okay. So I guess looking for a motion in a second. Okay, I move to approve first reading and introduction of ordinance number 879, reading by title only, waiving further reading, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Sonora, approving the First Amendment to the uh, development agreement by and between the City of Sonora and Bracked House, LLC. Second. Okay, so motion by Councilmember Garavena, second by Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Roll call vote, please. Mayor Hawkins? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer? Aye. Council Member Garaventa? Aye. Council Member Sagerstrom? Aye. And Council Member Such? No. Okay, so passes four to zero. One. To one. Four to one. Or four, four, to one. four to one, sorry. I'm trying to take notes at the same time, sorry. <laughs> okay, so on to item number 12, which is new business. Consideration to adopt resolution number 53-2021A, Greenlee Road Extension, as a priority regional road improvement for the City of Sonora and urge the Tuolumne County Transportation Council, TCTC, to prioritize funding for the project. Mary Rose. Um, Mr. Mayor, this item is actually coming from both myself and your city engineer, Jerry Fuchella. So I just wanna make sure he's unmuted. Um, so if Jerry, if you can, can you I'm asking you to, uh, there you go, yes. perfect. So I'm All just right. gonna do a brief, right. uh, hi Jerry. I'm going to uh, do a brief introduction and then I'm gonna ask Jerry to actually expand a little bit um, on this item and provide history. You know, Jerry has been with the city for quite a number of years. So he's got a lot of historical knowledge on this particular item. So again, this item is consideration to adopt resolution 0503-2021A, Greenlee Road Extension as a priority regional road improvement project for the city of Sonora and urging the Tuolumne County Transportation Council, TCTC, to prioritize funding for this project. This item is coming before you um, in direct response to um, the city council approved 2021 city goals and objectives. Um, that were adopted on February 22nd, 2021. Um, and they included ensuring formal adoption of the Greenlee Road Extension as a priority for the city, uh, for the city and Tuolumne County Transportation Council. And when we talk about what the Greenlee Road Extension is, it's actually identified project. It's not just a fictitious road route that we're thinking about in our head. It's an actually identified route that has been studied 
um, by the county and the city. And it's been in your uh, Tuolumne County Regional Transportation Plan, RTP plan, since 1975. And it was adopted as a priority project um, in 1987. And those documents, the map of what that Greenlee Road extension, where that would go, is included in your packet. Um, and also the original resolution, um, 051887-B is included in your packet. So you can see the historical documentation of the council adopting uh, Greenlee Road Extension as a priority pro project back in 1997. Jerry and I also included a Union Democrat article coming from 1989, um, wherein by the city council made a pitch to Tuolumne County to ensure the Greenlee Road extension still continues to be a priority project for the city of Sonora um, and receive funding um, to ensure uh, its completion. And one of the things of why we are looking at Greenlee Road uh, as a bypass around downtown, and those some of those um, have been identified in the resolution in that it, it reduces traffic congestion. We are seeing extreme severe traffic congestion downtown on your Highway 49 um, Washington Street corridor. Um, you want to see safer conditions uh, for pedestrians and vehicles due to less traffic congestion and driver frustration. Uh, we believe that better economic development with less traffic in the downtown access can allow for better access to parking and to allow for better um, tourists to be able to view our city, to park, to view our shops, to view our restaurants downtown. Um, and it also will serve as an alternate evacuation route as we are so concerned about fire safety and fire preparedness. We need the ability to have an additional route for a safe evacuation within the city of Sonora. And at this time, I will turn it over to your city engineer for additional information for the city council. Go ahead, Jerry, if you wanna add uh, additional comments. Yeah, council members, yeah, yes. Uh, I've been with the city a long time. Uh, this happens to be my 42nd year anniversary meeting uh, uh, as a city engineer. Uh, it was the first meeting in May 1979 was uh, my first meeting, uh, city council meeting uh, as a city engineer. And I've been around a long time, been here since 1970, uh, living in Sonora. And this is, and the traffic that you see on Washington Street today is the worst I, I've seen in, in my time here. Uh, you've got the backups every day and wait till the weather gets a little bit, bit better. Uh, during the tourist season. And now you're starting to see a weekend uh, stop and go on Washington Street. I mean, it's it's just terrible. I mean, we had, I remember we we, uh, we had severe traffic on weekends uh, up until maybe 1988 when we, they, they did the Sonora Bypass. Uh, before that, uh, Highway 108 had to come right through Stockton Street street and south washington street you had uh real backups there but when they built the bypass we had a real relief of traffic and we had very good economic conditions in the, in the late 80s or early 90s in this town I, and i'd like to see if we can't bring that back uh to, to the city uh, uh with a with a, a bypass of the city green road extension been on the books uh, 1975, uh, and I've I've got a lot of history on it, and, and, uh, on it, and the, the city was always for for the Greenway extension uh, to get the, the traffic out of town, so we can do a little more economic development. But with the conditions you have right now, you're starting to see uh, not only your Washington Street is at capacity. If you wanted to talk about level of service from A to F, A being the best, F is, is capacity. I call Washington Street all effed up uh, uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and the only solution that I see is you need to have a bypass around town. Trying to increase safety, uh, doing trails and bicycle, put people on bicycles or buses, it's not going to do it. You need a reduction of the traffic in the downtown area. And if you built that, they actually adopted a, a route uh, 1987 
it, it was federally funded and, uh, and, and uh, it also had state funding in it. And there was just a local share. It was a, a secondary, a federal aid secondary road. And it was full, it was designed. It was, they basically were ready to, to start the, uh, acquiring the property to build it. So I think we need to proceed and, and proceed on that, uh, that adopted route. I think you, they need to restudy the you know property uh, requirements and the grades and everything. But the map that that I have given you, uh, and I think we gave you eleven by seventeen copy of that at uh, at our uh, previous meeting, uh, that shows the Green Extension route that was adopted in 1987, 1.2 miles. You can't believe it. 1.2 miles of, of roadway would do so much good for this city. Uh, um, to, get, to get the traffic out of town. I think the, the, the advantages of having it done is reduced traffic congestion. Uh, you, you're really starting to see a lot of spin-off of traffic on Stewart Street, Lyon Street, uh, Elkin, and you're, you're gonna really start increasing uh, your, your accident uh, records. On it because you've got a lot of frustrated drivers. They come come into town. They, they they see the backup up to Elkin, and they they make that left, get onto the Stewart, and some of it is even going up to uh, to uh, uh, Jackson Street to get to get around town. And you know, I, don't, I, I look at it every day. You look at the traffic on, on Stewart Street and on on Lyons uh, Street, and you'll see it. And there's no solution other than to bypass around town. So, uh, and I think the other advantage is to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, it's fuel economy is the best thing, uh, you know. Uh, imagine, you know, a gallon of, of fuel is about 20 pounds of, of CO2 into the air. In that order, uh, gas is a little bit less, diesel is, a, is, is, a, is more. But you're averaging about 20 pounds a, a, a gallon of gas usage. Just look at fuel economy, your own fuel economy, uh, going uh, 25 miles per hour around town versus the, the five miles per hour you, you get stuck in traffic, stop and go, go into the downtown. Uh, and I think that this uh, would, reduction in traffic, would give you a lot safer conditions. If you wanna do some stuff downtown, uh, 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 on it, uh, similar to Murphy's, or, or, or but I think it, it will promote a little more tourist. And tourist, you know, they see this backup of traffic, they're trying to get away from it from coming up from the Bay Area. Uh, but when they see a backup of traffic, oh no, we're not going to go here, we'll go to Twain Heart or someplace like, like that. Uh, uh, and I think you look at a better economic development with it. And uh, uh, and the other third, the other reason uh, the, uh, with, the, with the fire uh, threat these days, uh, you've got uh, another evacuation route to get around town, and then you you would be creating a fire break in the town. Uh, there's a recent study that is called the uh, suggested corridor study 108 uh, 49 between Jamestown and, and, and the Columbia area. Uh, this was presented to you uh, in September. Uh, I did some other comments to it uh, uh, on it, but it was a very comprehensive report. It's 270 pages. Uh, uh, they, they looked at all ways of uh, reducing congestion. They come up with the Grindley Road extension is one of the better ways of reducing congestion in downtown Sonora. And, uh, uh, I think that this study is, is still being reviewed by the Caltrans staff. Uh, it's, it's expected to be adopted by the, by Caltrans uh, in June, uh, June, July, the end of this fiscal year. And uh, I have put a link is in the report, but it doesn't work. I, if, if you want to read this report, just let me know. I, I'll email you the, the correct link and you can take a look at the report yourself. A very complicated 270 page report uh, on it. But uh, I think this report is for the use of SB1 funding. 
And there's a potential with some advocacy of both the city, uh, the TCTC, as well as uh, Kalama County, uh, uh, that you can uh, perhaps get the state through SB1 funding to, to, to fund this road. Uh, on it. And, uh, and like it started out, it started out as a federal aid secondary road uh, uh, in, in the uh, late 70s. But uh, I do also have a lot of history on, on uh, Greenlee Road extension, uh, some history of, of the city uh, uh, between uh, 75 and, and 1997. There's been two alternate route studies, one in 1997 and one in 2006. And then it, it was adopted by both the city and the county as a priority as late as 2009, 2010. And I've got uh, all the documentation on that. Uh, if you wanna, uh, want me to email you uh, something that, that has uh, all the links on it, I, I, I put them all on, on, on the internet and you can just, uh, if you have the report uh, and you read it over the internet, you can just click on it and it'll, and it'll bring up all the, the uh, uh, these reports. But I really do think that you need to move ahead with the, the Greenlee Road extension. And I, I suggest you begin by adopting uh, the, the, uh, the resolution that's before you. So again, the item before you is um, coming from the city council adopted goals and objectives that ask staff to prioritize an adoption of a resolution prioritizing Greenlee Road extension as a priority for the city of Sonora. Um, in consultation with TCTC, they wanted to ensure that that road is still a priority for the city, even though it was adopted in 2009 as a priority project between the city and the county. So this is again in um, showing um, to the Transportation Council that this Greenlee Road extension is a priority and should have be seen as a priority funding um, for the city. Um, it is going to require qu quite a bit of coordination between the city, uh, TCTC and the county because the Greenlee Road extension does um, go along um, county um, jurisdiction so that's this is just the start of the discussion and then hopefully you know um if the council so chooses to adopt this resolution the expansion of discussion between the county tctc and the city any council member questions uh, I, I just have a comment um about uh, the ripple effect of um of washington street and um, and uh, drivers seeking alternative routes um, on Stewart and Lyons. And I mean, they're, they're using it as a cutoff and you know, they're driving 40 miles an hour through residential neighborhoods. I mean, it's, it's darn scary um, if you happen to live in that area. But also, you know, the extension, I think, will uh, eliminate some of the pressure of getting to the Justice Center. I mean, since it's a direct connection down Greenlee to the Justice Center. I mean, I can see lots of reasons uh, that um, uh, that we should take it up again as a as a priority. And um, you know, just living in Sonora and seeing the the the, uh, the influx of people that are trying to get through our metro area to go other places, they need they need outlet. And uh, and it is it's amazing to think that that's just 1.2 miles. But uh, you know, I'm. Seriously, all for it. Okay. Anyone else? I'm going I'm to have a similar comment here, but I'll wait till after public. Okay. I, I in, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. I do have a question for staff, mm -hmm. and uh, I quite agree with Council Member Sagerstrom that this is probably one of the best things that we can do for the city. But my question then for Mr. Fucello, is how timely is this for finding funding for it? A couple of years ago, I spoke with Darren and it sounded like there should be money for things that will reduce idling and, and traffic, stalled traffic, that that would be good for both air and uh, fuel consumption. Is that, I mean, is money still out there? 
Yeah, I think the money is out there with this SB1 funding. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of, of money. If Caltrans approves something that, oh, we need to put this as a priority to reduce traffic congestion. And I think it's it's up to us, to uh, us and uh, as, well, as well as the county and the TCTC to convince Caltrans that they ought to put their money into this. Uh, on it. And uh, I think that, that the money needs to be pursued. There is some mitigation fee money that could be put in it, but uh, it, uh, the problem has been the, the congestion on a state highway that is at level F of uh, level of service. And I think that we ought to be pushing on that. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. So uh, uh, you follow up if I may, and that is this, we've been trying for what, 45 years it appears or, or longer, I'm not even trying to do the math in my head right off, but for a couple of gener well, several generations, what has stalled it or kept it from going forward? Just inertia? Um, I'm sort of at a loss here because it seems like it's very popular. Uh, well, I call it, it's been politically gridlocked. Thank you. Yeah, we could probably go through the rest of all night to midnight to tell all the different stories that are behind why it hasn't gone that far, but um, um, I'll just leave it at that. I'll wait for public. Oh, 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 I was gonna say, the you're talking about what, what pots of funding. The best person to really ask that is, is Darren Grossi, who's the executive director of Transportation Council, people don't know. Um, he would know all the different um, mechanisms there could, could be air quality money cmac money there could be uh, you know different transportation plan money that's eligible so but uh, but jerry mentions sb1 and it's it's because of sb1 that makes it more plausible um for funding now than it did remember a few years ago we were talking it was a tier two um consideration and that was 24 years out and by bringing SB1 money into it has brought it back to the front burner again. And um, uh, and by this action, literally this action tonight, making the city asking the TCTC to make it a priority brings it up to up to the front burner and so and yeah, gets yeah. it done faster. It or has the potential to get it done much faster. Thank you for the explanation. I had to talk with Gary, uh, with Darren of well, when I first came on the council, and at that point he was optimistic, but we it just nothing ever went anywhere. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it, it's a matter of cooperation between the different agencies. It's all in it's all in the county, so we have to get the county thing and county approval. And then there's been in previous years there's been less cooperation between the city and the county and on you know, many issues, and <laughs> including Greenlee Road. So, yeah. um, but you know, it's it's a complicated set of so this might be a really propitious moment to push it forward. Yep. So that's why we need to move on with uh, doing this. I was going to say, just throwing out some, uh, to me, some common sense observations. 1.2 miles. Yes, it's going to cost taxpayer funding to build that 1.2 miles. But I think in the end, uh, one of the things that Jerry really laid out, and I appreciate it, Jerry, for you saying so, is it gives us another evacuation route or a possible evacuation route. Um, you know, it, greenhouse gases, everyone's talking about greenhouse gases, smog. Um, it's a fact that if your vehicle is at a lower, if you have a gasoline or diesel vehicle and it's in a lower RPM, but you're going faster, you're using less fuel, that's a fact. So to me, it's, it, it's common sense to build something or push to build something that's only 1.2 miles long and have a better fuel economy, less smog. Stop and go traffic is the reason LA looks the way LA looks with the giant clouds above it. And that's kind of what I picture when I think of smog and greenhouse gases. So if things are moving more freely, I think everybody benefits. Plus, I know you'll get a lot of uh, work trucks, logging trucks, passers through not uh, coming into downtown and others that want to stop that 
don't want to be bombarded by the amount of traffic. And that was a good, good very good comment. To me, this just makes complete sense. So I, I'll, I'll be all for it, but I also would like to hear what the public has to say too. Those, any other council members have any questions, comments? Okay, so we're looking for public comment. At this time, if you have public comment on this item, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature or star nine on your phone. And there is a public comment from Rachel Beckham. Go ahead, Rachel. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not going to speak on this, but um, since it's here, I will. Um, I live pretty close to downtown and I, I hear the concerns. I just feel um, what I feel to go forward um, for the public that we need some research on what bypasses do to downtown businesses, historic downtown businesses. Because I've been part of communities and my family have where we've owned businesses in historic areas and a bypass comes in and it becomes a ghost town. So just some research on similar communities that follow uh, what Sonora, you know, families come up and want to enjoy the weekend. And when you're driving through downtown, it's kind of, they know it's there, you know, that old saying, out of sight, out of mind. And I just don't want downtown to disappear. I mean, that would be my biggest concern. I don't know if it will or won't. I just feel like for the public um, to have some research on other towns that have done that, and what did it do to their downtown, their historic downtown areas? I think that would just help us, um, you know, for the public. And also in the meantime, like places like Lyons and stuff and Stewart Street, which those are, those are kind of the areas I live in. Um, speed bumps, I'm not sure, you know, if, if that's a possibility. I don't know if that could be part of, you know, a little, it's a little cheaper than um, construction. I'm just throwing these um, ideas out and some extra information for the public, just a little bit more research on what it would do to um, businesses downtown. Because I went to Jackson last Saturday and it was a ghost town downtown. I go to Sonora, I go downtown quite often. I love walking down there and I love seeing the life. And I know it's a pain, um, but I just don't want it to see it die either. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, your next public comment is from Carol Woods. Oh, go ahead, Carol. Um, you need to unmute yourself, Carol. Okay. There you go. Am I in? Okay. Yes. Um, I have some questions about this, especially as somebody uh, through whose front yard this bypass is probably going to run. Um, and uh, in support of the other neighbors who might have the same kinds of questions about what's going to happen to our property when they put the bypass through my front yard. Um, I have a question of whether we are trying to solve, trying to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. Um, the traffic downtown, I don't think is, um, it is worse than it was 30 years ago. I've lived here that long as well. I don't think it is so bad that it is uh, that it keeps people from shopping down there. In fact, uh, I would agree with the previous speaker that when you run a bypass around a uh, central, you know, business district, um, when we ran the bypass through the central business district before, we lost everything that made it a business district and got only antique stores. So, uh, you know, what it will be when uh, you run a bypass around uh, the, the downtown again, I don't know. Um, I don't feel that the traffic is that big an issue. I've driven through this town, you know, many times, and perhaps I now have to wait five more minutes than I did before, using all that money and doing all that construction in order to save me five minutes just doesn't seem like that important uh, thing. Um, I'm also concerned, as the previous speaker was, about using essentially a 40-year-old or 50-year-old plan uh, for a bypass uh, when the neighborhood through which it is being driven has changed to some extent and you're looking at displacing more homeowners or ruining their property. Um, anyway, those are some of my concerns. I think there should be quite a lot of public comment about this and input. 
Um, I don't know what the proposed timeline is, so I have some questions about that. I have some questions about how concrete and possible this is. Um, and I just feel like perhaps uh, this is overkill and that money should be better spent on escape group roads from whether it's from the neighborhood I live in, which is the one where the bypass would be, or uh, other neighborhoods, I think the money could be better spent on escape routes for people who have no other, way out, no other way out of their neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Is there anyone else? At this time, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any additional public comment. Okay. <laughs> So we'll bring it back to the council and council member such has her hand raised. I, um, I just have a couple questions. Um, I'm not um, against this project. The, I have been against it, but the greenhouse gas emission kind of caught me. Um, but I wanna also remind people that we have to then factor in the greenhouse gas that will, and the congestion that will be created, created on the existing Greenlee Road where we have a hospital and a grammar school, that will become a different, we're just moving the nightmare over, I think. Um, <clears throat> now, green, the existing Greenlee Road isn't um, uh, the historic di district, so that's a little bit different. Um, I also, I actually had coffee with Melissa, the um, city administrator in Angels, who says Highway 4 killed Angels Camp and it's never recovered. And if anyone goes to Angel's Camp, no one stops. They keep driving right through. When Sutter Creek was bypassed, it took those shopkeepers say that it took the, that city eight years to recover. So I wonder if the merchants really understand this. We also have a huge shift in, in uh, personnel downtown happening, happening currently with our new courts, with the proposal to perhaps move the DA's office the um, the public defender. We've lost the jury jury down down there. Um, so you know things are changing rapidly in Sonora right now, and in the near future. Um, I also have some concerns, not about my the neighborhood, but the view of an ugly bypass when you're driving into Sonora from Stockton Road, the east the east. Um, the bypass of, to East Sonora is pretty unsightly. So if we do move forward with this plan, I ask that there be some aesthetic sense about how, about how it works. You go to other communities and their roads are beautiful, the railings are beautiful, their bridges are beautiful, and we cannot just build a big, ugly uh, cement freeway, which is what we did with the last bypass. Um, and did I have any other comments? Um, I'm, I'm also curious about how it will cross the ditch. Um, and, and also as, a, as another, um, I think Rachel mentioned um, that we need to revisit the route. This, this should have fresh eyes from not 40 year old eyes on this, but fresh eyes on this project and the, the um, and why the route that was chosen was chosen. If there's a longer, a slightly longer route that costs more, but but doesn't devastate a neighborhood, I think that should be considered. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilmember Sagerstrom. Um, I, I did ask about speed bumps downtown, uh, <laughs> and I was. Um, uh, told that uh, because of fire trucks, mm -hmm. um, that they can cannot be constructed on, on uh, through streets like Lyons um, or, <laughs> I mean, Jackson Street's now becoming a through street, but um, you know, it's about as wide as the dais and, uh, and people are parked on both sides. So it's, it's just, you know, the, the, those kinds of controls are uh, desirable, but impossible. But um, I think, do think that, um, you know, re-looking at uh, the route and the effect, um, I, I remember the property owners were um, a major um, uh, blockage to um, the Greenlee extension last time. 
And, you know, so their potential is there again. And, you know, and they have and their right to have concerns. So um, um, I think with this resolution that there should be, you know, a, a, a triumvirate of uh, input from the city and the county and, uh, and uh, TCTC. And, uh, you know, as uh, Colette said, you know, maybe fresh eyes, maybe this is still the best solution, but, uh, but uh, it's a whole different team looking at it in 2021. Anyone else? I have, I have a question for uh, council member such, and that is, I, I had also, when the bypass was first put in, had great concerns about uh, Sutter Creek, which is a wonderful little town. And subsequent to that, I didn't know that it had recovered after eight years, but, but um, I had a friend who had bought the foxes and then had to sell it within a year because his wife went blind. But it's, a little, it's one of the B&Bs at the north end of town. And um, anyway, my understanding is that now that they are once again fully alive and doing well and I've been told, I have no other information on it, but that in some ways it's a lot better because the people who are going there are going there as a destination and that you don't have people driving through to get someplace quickly and that it's in some ways a safer, more agreeable place to visit. Does that comport with your knowledge? And well, I'm not, I, I, I do agree. It's just that it took it killed it took it for long. eight years. Yeah. It was devastated for eight years. Okay, um, but but absolutely, I think it's a charming town now. Um, I, I don't disagree with that at all. The other, see, I would also support a little flexibility in in trying to make the route work because my understanding is, is that uh, one of the reasons that it got stopped was because it went through important people's front yards practically, and we're going to just destroy old properties and, and old homesteads. And it's understandable that that would be blocked. And I think that uh, if we can work on a little more flexibility, working with our other partners on this project, that we might be able to finally get it off the ground. Councilmember Garvina. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've I've heard that as well, and I, and I think that with um, I, I think when we when there's a study to to go forward from this, I think that's exactly what we'll there'll be fresh eyes looking at it, and they'll be looking at at uh, different um, routes. I know the last time we had the north south study, which was which is was called um, north south connector. Um, there was, uh, back in the 2000s and something, there was um, um, several routes actually looked at and it, it got narrowed down to, to some of the more extravagant routes. I think there was a route that went into um, the back side of where you go into um, Sawmill Flat Road at just above Squabble Town at Martinez and that corner, that very sharp corner with the big tree. They were thinking about putting it there, coming in there, that was one route. And it would come, it would actually start higher up on the hill um, at the Hess Avenue, Phoenix Lake Road interchange. With, and that was, that was the far one they looked at, but there was all kinds of different routes in between that they were looking at. And they kind of done, done it down, um, narrowed it down. So there is alternative routes in, in plans um, that are already out there. So, and I think certainly uh, being our representative on the council with Colette, that I'm certainly going to uh, make sure that we just don't, you know, go back to 1987 and say, that's it. And we're only going to do it. We need to make sure that we're take, taking all kinds of alternatives and in, into, into play. Um, one thing that was mentioned was about Sutter Creek and, and angels and, um, I, and how bypasses destroyed their, or, you know, have made a big impact on their economies. And that's when they actually moved the state highway out of, and made that a bypass. But Greenlee Road is not, not moving 49 onto Greenlee Road. 
49 will still come down through Main Street. And I think that's significant enough that there's people will follow the state highway routes and come into town. So I don't think that's, um, I, I don't see building a Greenlee Road and seeing downtown destroyed. Um, and I think that's a factor in that. Um, we did the same thing when the Momire by, bypass, um, bypassing 108. And there was, there, was, there was a bit of a lull and a lot of the gas stations that were downtown moved out of downtown, but they were kind of doing that anyway. I mean, it, it was cheaper to move out of town basically and be on, on, a, on a route. Um, so I think having the extension also makes it more amenable for all the Vision Sonora projects that we talk about. I think it'd be more, more people, it'd be more of a walkable, bikeable downtown if there's not so many cars downtown idling around and, and you're afraid to get your get hit or whatever. So I think it actually helps in some of the Vision Sonora projects that we're talking about. Um, so, and there's, you know, um, um, as well as all the different reasons. So I, I definitely support um, going forward and making an adopted, or um, uh, what are we doing? We're um, uh, making it a priority for the, the uh, council, transportation council. Um, I think there's a lot of benefits. We just have to be careful that we don't um, in how we do it. And I think the people are there to make sure that we don't do that. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councilman Sutton. I just wanna, I just recently timed driving downtown and it was last week and traffic, I was, at the car wash and traffic was backed up to the car wash just north of town on 49, which is pretty backed up. I mean, that's a pretty extreme traffic jam. And it took me seven minutes to get to the signal. When I drive, when I time that route at night when there's no one, no traffic, it takes me three and a half. So we're talking, we're really, we were clearly talking about a four minute savior, say, saving four minutes of time. It's not that much. It's not that much, but the diff. But green. I, I don't know how to argue against greenhouse gases. I'd be a hypocrite. So, anyhow, well, that, I, that's I, it. I think I think that one of this is one of the opportunities for this council to really bequeath something good. If we can, if we can get it off its feet, to bequeath something really lasting and good that will improve the quality of life. Uh, and to touch back on your desire to to have it not unattractive, I'm all with you there, and I'd love to see us push on that note to even ask for some more, you know, shade or screen bushes behind Walmart and that type of thing, because those are the areas where people coming in see us. I mean, that's the first impression for a lot of people, and. We want to have it attractive. So with that, I would like to move to adopt resolution 05-03-2021-A, uh, the Greenlee Road Extension as a priority regional road improvement for the city of Sonora and urge the Transportation Council of Tuolumne County to prioritize, prioritize funding for the project. And I would like to second that. Okay, got a motion by Councilmember Garavena, second by Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. The only thing I wanted to throw in there and add, because I want to let everybody speak about it first, is that I would not be for this because Carol and Rachel have definitely heard you, but I've, I've talked to a lot of people about the same thing. And I could not be for this if I thought it was going to take out somebody's house or, or some historical property like that. And the good part is, is that when the state comes in and starts doing these type of things, there's even bigger studies. So um, I'll call for a roll call vote, please. Mayor Hawkins. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Plummer. Aye. Council Member Garaventa. Aye. Council Aye. Member Sagerstrom. Aye. And Council Member Such. Aye. Okay, passes five to zero. I would like to take a five minute break. It's now 6.50 and we will come back at 6.55.
Okay, the time is now 6.56 and we're back from a break. So item number uh, 13 is provide staff direction regarding possible action of amending chapter 17.64 uh, transient residential use short-term rentals. Mary Rose. Mayor City Council members, I am going to be presenting to you a PowerPoint presentation on this item. So if you just bear with me a moment, I'm just going to share my screen here. I can find my oh, right. Where's Chris? Obviously, he's not. There it is. Hold on just a moment. Okay, can everybody hopefully see that? Yep. Hopefully the members of the public can all see that. Yep. Okay, um, the item before you is looking at providing direction to staff regarding possible action of amending chapter 17.64 transient residential use. So this item is not actually asking for um, an actual vote, but direction. Um, at the end of this presentation. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, and then also just wanted to um, present the um, for the public's reference and for the city council as a way to remind you um, the amount of times that this issue has come before the council in regards to direction for transient residential use. So on February 22nd, 2021, the city council approved the 2000, let me move this, hold on just a moment. Is that easier for people to see? Um, the 2021 Sonora Goals and Objectives, which included exploring all opportunities to provide best practice and dignified solutions to our growing homeless population and low income and affordable housing needs. And then last meeting on April 19th, the City Council approved the 2021 strategic plan, which included an action item based on that above objective to address barriers to long-term housing, such as reviewing and modification of the city's transient residential use or short-term rental program. On March 15, 2021, the City Council directed staff to agendize at a future meeting for discussion and possible action amend amending Chapter 17.64 of the Sonora Municipal Code to limit short-term rentals in the City of Sonora. And on April 5th, the City Council approved a moratorium of all new transient residential use permits in the City until further direction was given to staff regarding a parcel amendment to Chapter 17.64. So this is the third um, public meeting in which the City Council has um, actively addressed this issue. And then if you look back from February 22nd and also on April 19th, in which we discussed the city council goals, objectives and action plan, um, this is addressed in those items as well. So multiple meetings in which the city council and the public have had ability to comment on this item. When we talk about what is a short-term rental, um, a short-term rental is defined as a dwelling unit that are rented for periods lasting less than 30 days. Common examples include renting a house or apartment for a week or weekend, or a short stay, several weeks associated with business travel, long vacations. Short-term rentals are most commonly offered and rented through online hosting platforms such as Airbnbs, VRBO, and HomeAway. There's other options uh, as well. Jody, would you mind lowering that screen there so that the public can see? Um, Yes, minimize it, please, so they can see all that. Thank you. And then short-term rentals provide income to residents, and they provide broader lodging options than existing hotel market. It allows for an expansion of your tourism industry, and it also provides TOT revenue for critical city priorities. So we do, um, you know, the TOT that the city collects on Airbnbs, we do, it's part of our general fund revenue, and we're going to talk about that um, as we go forward with, <coughs> excuse me, within the presentation, I've got some bad allergies, excuse me. So what currently exists within the city of Sonora as in regards to transient residential use? I will say um, as a newer city administrator, I'm quite proud of the city of looking at this back in 2015 at the cusp of when Airbnbs really took off or excuse me, short-term residential use really took off. Um, and at that time, the city did develop a land use ordinance, a zoning ordinance addressing short-term rentals within a residential neighborhood. So on February 2nd, 2015, the city of Sonora adopted ordinance number 824, which added chapter 17.64, establishing regulations of transient residential use related to vacation 
rental of residential facilities. So at that time, we um, it requires, and currently the, <laughs> the ordinance requires a transient use permit. And in some cases, it requires a business license. And when I say some cases, because it really depends on those gross receipts. If you have gross receipts of $5,000 or more a year, you are required to hold a city of Sonora business license. So it is treated as a business. Um, and then renewal of a permit each year on July 1st. So you, will, you do require an initial use permit, and then it requires you to renew those permits and their associated fees with both the use permit and the renewal. And then it does require payment of transient occupancy tax, just like any hotel or normal bed and breakfast. It does require an on-call representative to manage property within 30 minutes anytime the property is occupied for transient use. And the ordinance already establishes a number, a maximum number of occupants, 18 and older, two persons per bedroom plus one additional person per parcel. The current ordinance allows two vehicles to be allowed to be parked on city streets. So when we look at what one was adopted in 2015 versus what is happening on the short term rental market now, there is a significant dif dif difference between those six years be uh, between 2015 and now. And, and I included this uh, map and also this kind of blurb of um, information in your packet. And I just wanted to talk briefly about it. Um, that map represents the active Airbnbs as of last week, Chris, I believe, um, in the city of Sonora. So there is quite centralized within your residential neighborhoods. Obviously, the city of Sonora, only three square miles. Um, it's quite significant to see those, um, those short-term rentals within our three square miles. There are currently, at, and we're looking at data through 2019. And why we chose 2019 is because 2020 obviously had extreme implications on your short-term market. Um, and that is because of the, the, the limitations that the state imposed on the ability for persons to rent um, <coughs> their residency as a short-term um, rental. And so when we looked at the numbers through 2019, we we're seeing um, a, a quite significant difference between 2015 versus 2019. And in 2015, the city had less than five short-term rental properties. Compare that to 2000, August of 2019, before COVID-19, the, the city identified 46 active short-term rental properties, of which only 36 were permitted. So we had 10 that were operating within the city of Sonora, collecting revenue that were not permitted um, and not paying any type of TOT revenue to the city. Um, in 2015, the medium home sales price was $225,750. And now, um, per your TCAR, um, let me pull it up for you to make sure I have the correct language. Uh, your TCAR um, stats, the medium home price sales um, this last first quarter for 2021 was 342,000, which is a 52% increase in home value since 2015. And obviously those increase in prices is having a drastic impact on the ability of housing supply within the city of Sonora. And current demand we're seeing for housing ownership and rental. So when we talk about housing stock, we're talking both in terms of ownership and rental, not just rental, um, substantially is exceeding supply at this point. So what are the significant downsides? We talked about um, the, the good things that short-term rentals provide for the city. It provides income for residents. It provides an opportunity for um, um, business opportunities for residents to be able to improve upon blighted property. We talked about income from TOT for the city of Sonora and allows for a private you know, tourism industry with here in Sonora. But what are the, what are the significant downsides to short-term rentals within the city? Popularity and profitability has spurred industry, an industry of buying and selling properties exclusively for short-term rentals, removing housing stock that would otherwise be used for long-term leases, and rotating a series of vacation renters in residential neighborhoods, creating traffic, noise, parking, safety concerns, and not just um, criminal safety concerns. We want to, the, the fire chief is going to talk later on about fire safety concerns we have for neighborhoods. And it introduces, it may introduce commercial and business uses into previously residential areas, such as larger homes being rented out for weddings, corporate retreats, and so forth, which are not typical residential use, uses in no zones. 
So I'm going to ask your community development director to come out to come up and talk to the city council about um, how the city regulates short term rentals through our current zone, zoning ordinance. Um, and she's going to kind of go into depth about um, how we regulate it and um, how we do have the ability through land use zoning to regulate these type of rentals. Thank you. Um, Mary Rose asked me to talk a little bit on kind of a zoning 101 um, for you guys just to make it clear what what how that works. Um, so zo our zoning ordinance, it regulates you this throughout the state of California, all city and county and zoning ordinance, they regulate or restrict what landowners can do with their property. And um, it is tied, especially in California, because California has general plan, it is tied to the implementation of the general plan. So your general plan is your over, over, overarching document and then everything feeds off of that, including your zoning ordinance. Um, your zoning ordinance, sorry, must serve to protect public health, safety and welfare as well. And all properties within the city or a county are placed within a zoning district. And then the uses allowed within that zoning district um, have to be explicitly spelled out um, so people know what is allowed within that zoning district. Um, and it's, those zoning districts are tied back again to your general plan land use map. So it all feeds into each other and it's supposed to be consistent so that it's um, very clear on uses allowed and it's tied together. Um, if the code is silent on a use, if, if it's not listed as a use, then it's not allowed in that district, plain and simple. If, it, if it's not listed, it's not allowed. Um, the, um, all properties within the same zone must be treated alike and allowed uses should be compatible with each other. So um, we look at that when anybody comes in with a new use um, that they'd like to introduce to a district. We look at it across the district. We can't just look at one property and make sure that that use, um, um, if we were to amend our zoning ordinance to allow it, such as we did with microbreweries, um, we've done it. Um, we actually did it with the transient use um, zoning ordinance. We looked at where it's compatible. Um, where would these type of short-term rentals be compatible with other uses in the city? So um, we do that analysis at any time we look at changing. As far as the legality, I would leave that to Doug as far as um, what gives the city the right to do this. There are, um, it is tied to the California constitution and other things, but that's a question that you guys can ask him. Um, as far as businesses within our residential areas, which is really kind of the main, main topic and, and concern as far as the interaction. Um, so we do have, we have the transient residential use zoning ordinance that was adopted in 2015. Mary Rose already told you what's in there. Um, and we also have home occupations, which we regulate, which are a little different, but I wanted to go into a little bit on how we regulate those, which is actually much more uh, stricter than what we do with our transient use um, ordinance, um, with the exception that um, they do have to register um, some more information than we do with a, with um, our home occupations. Um, chapter 17.59 is the chapter that regulates home occupations. And home occupations are restricted in a lot of ways. Um, they are restricted as to um, they can only use one room out of the house. It can't exceed 25% of the total occupied space of the house. Um, they can use a garage. Um, but they also, we regulate um, that the owner must, it must be owner occupied in order for them to have a home occupation um, in those uh, residential units. And the, the business has to be secondary to the residential use. So the primary use is that they live there and then they can have this business. Uh, they can't advertise or, or um, the address to the public, nor can they put signs up if, they're having, if they have a home occupation. Um, traffic generated from the business is limited to six vehicle trips per day. So um, you can only have basically three clients coming to your residence. You can't generate any sales. You can't have sales. It can't be like a retail spot or anything like that. 
and there's no generation of additional pedestrian traffic or parking beyond the normal to a single family dwelling. Um, and that includes commercial deliveries. So if you have a business that has a lot of UPS or big trucks coming in, um, that is limited because you, um, it's supposed to be as if it was just a residence. Um, and parking related to the home occupation must be provided on the parcel. Um, they can't um, use street parking for it. It has to be provided on the um, parcel and it has to be in addition to those spaces that they need for just living there. So that's that's how home occupations are, are regulated. Mary Rose kind of went over already how we do transient use. So um, the home occupation, we are a little bit more stricter on what they can do um, as far as parking and other requirements. The other thing on with home occupations though, it's a one and done. You come in, you apply for a permit, once you have it, you're done and you never have to come back and get it renewed, unlike the transient use permit. And they don't pay TOT naturally because they're not um, a transient use or a bed and breakfast or anything like that. So they would not pay that. Both um, include the provision um, of business license. Um, it's the $5,000 trigger. And actually that's how transient use was set because it was already in the home occupation from way before I started doing this job, this was around. So we, um, we've updated it, kind of made it clear for people. It was pretty complicated before, um, but um, it was home occupation permits been around for a lot of years, um, but $5,000 was the trigger for that to trigger a business license. So we carried it over when we put the transient use ordinance together. Beyond that, um, there are some other limited business activities that can occur in residential zoned areas, um, R3 especially, um, but they all require a use permit. Um, there's nothing, no other type of business that would not have a public process in a residential, a residential zoned area. Um, and there, it is very limited um, as to what can occur. So they do go through that notification process, the 300 foot and there is a process. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uses allowed by right versus uses re, uh, requiring a use permit. But uses allowed by right, it means that they have a right to have a ministerial approval of their application. That does not mean that they don't have to comply with setbacks and other requirements that are also in the code. But they do, it is a ministerial approval. So they can come in, get their building permit. And unless they trigger site plan or design review, they just come in and they get their permit and they move forward. They don't have to go back for any type of discretionary approval as with transient use. They get their permit and they move on and they have to comply with whatever's in the, in the requirements. So that is the difference um, between a use permit where you actually, it's discretionary, goes before the planning commission. Uh, planning commission is the final approval body unless there's an appeal to you. So it's different and we can set conditions specific to that project. Just like you guys just, we went through with the cannabis. They have very specific conditions. So I just wanted to let you know when we did the transient use, um, there are requirements and restrictions on when that, where that use can occur. Um, in our AR, which is our agricultural reserve zone, in our RE, which is our residential estate zone, our R1, single family, you guys hear that all the time. Our R2, limited manufacture, uh, limited multifamily, sorry, residential zone. Transient use, they can do one single family structure or one, or one um, single family unit on a, per parcel. They're limited to one. On our R3, they can have two on one parcel. Um, in our CO zone, in our C um, commercial zone, so our CO is our tourist administrative zone, um, it's a use allowed by right. Uh, they, it, we did not set a restriction on how many units they could have on that parcel. And then in our CG zone, it's not permitted at all. That's our general commercial zone and neither is it allowed in our manufacturing zone, our ML. Um, in contrast, I wanted to, um, oh, also, sorry, transient residential use of multifamily residential structures or multiple single family in the R2 zone. So if they want more than one in an R2 zone, if they want more than two in an R3 zone, they have to have a use permit. So they'd have to go through the public process of a use permit, and that's for your transient use. In contrast, a bed and breakfast, a bed and breakfast is allowed by right in your CO and your C zone, your commercial zones. 
not permitted in your CG or your ML zones, which is your manufacturing or your general commercial, your shopping center. The reason we don't allow it in CG or ML is residential use is not a use allowed in those zones. I mean, there's some pre-existing stuff, but no, you're, it's not allowed. It's, it's strictly commercial or manufacturing type. And when, uh, and then a bed and breakfast can, is allowed with a use permit in your R2 and your R3 zone. So I just wanted to kind of kind of show you the difference as to when we allowed what or what, what was allowed when, and that it's not allowed everywhere. If, if you think that it is, it, it isn't. It's tied to a zoning district. It's a use that's tied to a zoning district, just like any of the other uses that we would restrict on residential or commercial property. So, so we, that's what I wanted to let you We know. wanted to walk the council through that because I know there's been some confusion about um, what is allowable in your private property. And I just wanted to show the council that we do regulate uses um, in any zone within the city of Sonora. You, we have residential zones, commercial zone, manufacturing zones, and those are all regulated as to those uses within our code. And so I wanted Rochelle to walk that through that because we do regulate right now your transient use and we do regulate businesses within a residential zone. And as you can tell, it's very um, stringent on what types of businesses and business use right now is currently allowable within a residential zone. Yeah, the biggest thing is compatibility when you're looking at your districts. Um, <clears throat> I tried to take really good notes, but I felt it fell apart. We still have more me. of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any way I could have a copy of just Sure, this, I'll make it look a little neater than what I just read off of, oh, but yes. No, I, don't, I don't want to give you more work. I can also watch the, the yeah. video. Okay. But so we'll provide just, additional. I just thought it was really interesting. Thank you. No problem. Wait, we still have the full presentation, but if. <laughs> okay. I'm not going anywhere. So. <laughs> Sorry, just so I know that there was a lot of concern about what other cities are doing um, about short term rentals in their jurisdictions. Um, and um, in doing research and um, uh, calling up and talking to other cities, um, looking at county ordinances, looking at city ordinances, there are many cities and counties across the, the state and the country that are starting to regulate short term rentals because of their impact on housing stock and residential character within your residential neighborhoods. Many of our California coastal and Southern cities require primary residency of a short-term rental, meaning um, the, the, the owner of the property must reside within the property and rent out generally a room or two within that residency um, and remain a primary resident of that facility. So the opposite of that would be somebody who purchases a home to rent it as an Airbnb as a business or somebody that has a second home up here within Sonora and rents it as an Airbnb uh, when they are not there utilizing their second home. So again, many of your coastal cities, and when I mean many, you were talking about all along your central coast, Monterey, Pacific Grove, Carmel, going north into the Bay Area, you've got Millbrae, Pacifica, Redwood City, going down to the south in your Southern California cities. Um, and uh, they require primary residency of that short-term rental. They also require a certain amount of days that the host, the property owner must reside within the residency to be able to have an active permit. Um, some are extremely stringent, um, 275 days a year, they must reside within that facility. Others are between 120 to 180 days. Um, so I just wanted to let you know in regards to what we're seeing in a coastal and Southern California city. When we look at coastal mountain towns like us, um, the Lake Tahoe region most notably has been active on regulating short-term rentals. El Dorado County recently passed in 2019 um, an ordinance um, on uh, short-term rentals that restricts the number of Airbnbs to a specific number, allowing within the greater unincorporated Tahoe Basin within El Dorado County, they only allow up to 900 units to be actively permitted. Placer County, Posse County is the same thing. Truckee is taking an active stance. And then also within the state of Nevada, they are also limiting um, the amount of short-term rentals within the Lake Tahoe Basin on their side, and they have limited to 600 units. 
So those, it's a difference. So those are actually having limits on the number of units, not necessarily on the primary versus secondary residency of an actual unit. When you look at the city of South Lake Tahoe in 2018, the citizens passed an initiative ballot measure that phases out short-term rentals within the city of Lake Tahoe on December 31st, 2021. So they took an actual ballot measure in front of the voters, it passed and they are phasing them out in any zone on December 31st, 2021. And they, in 2018, they stopped issuing any permits for short-term rentals in the city of South Lake Tahoe. San Diego recently in February, San Diego was having um, uh, large impacts to their housing stock. Um, in the fall of 2020, they were looking at the short-term rentals as a, as a uh, severe impact to their housing stock. They had estimated that there were over 15,000 short-term rentals within the city of San Diego. In February, their city council voted to limit short-term rentals to 1% of the total housing units within the city of Sonora. So in conjunction with the city of Sonora, 1% of our housing units, our housing units are about 2,700, 1% of our housing stock would be about 27 units total, to put it in perspective. So when we look at it from a staff perspective of what, what is happening within the city of Sonora as far as housing availability, and remember, we're looking at it from the priority set by the city council of looking at housing affordability, housing in general, and ensuring that we have the ability to provide housing to our works, workforce. So staff is continuing to monitor rental availability within the city of Sonora. <clears throat> and we do that, gosh, on a weekly basis, right, Jody? We're calling up, we're calling up rental um, apartments, we're calling up landlords, we're looking, we're scouring the internet. And we're actually having conversations with property owners. And I'm gonna talk to you about a conversation we had about a, with a property owner up here in a, about a minute. And we've noticed that, we have very limited to almost no availability of rentals in the city of Sonora. And it fluctuates between one or two available units to zero on a daily to weekly basis. So I wanna give a case study to the, to the city council of a, recent, of a recent rental property, of a discussion that we had that the community development department had with a property owner. Um, and she felt compelled to, to ask staff to relay this information to the city council because she wanted to ensure that the city council understands the desperation of residents looking for housing within the city of Sonora. She allowed us to use uh, the property address of her property and it's 18 Columbia Way, Sonora. It's a two bedroom, one bath, 1,000 square foot apartment available June 1st, 2021. The rent established for that 1,000 square foot apartment is 1,400 per, per month plus a deposit. Um, which is pretty high for considering our, um, our medium income here in the city of Sonora. She listed this vacancy on Craigslist and Sonoraville rents and had 123 inquiries within a matter of days. 43 of those inquiries were from Craigslist, 60 were from Sonoraville rents, and 40 submitted serious applications to be able to rent this apartment. Multiple people offered 200 to 400 per month in addition to the $1,400 rent per month in an effort to gain the apartment. So I just wanted to talk to you and bring that to light about the seriousness that we are facing when we, got, when we talk about housing availability. And I just wanna also reiterate some statistics that TCAR gave the city of Sonora back in April, on April 6, 2021. And they stated in the report from February, 2020, that the quote unquote, the shortage of home sales is making home buyer competition more intense than ever. 36% of homes sold last month in February went for more than their asking price, the largest share on record according to Redfin, which is the source they use. An extreme imbalance between supply and demand is the primary factor driving up home prices within the county of Tuolumne and obviously the city of Sonora as well. <clears throat> so now that you've heard a little bit about the statistics in which we are seeing um, from other jurisdictions, seeing the implications of the good and the bad of short-term rentals or the, the 
the implications it brings, the, the finances it brings to the city, but also the limitations on housing stock. A couple of things that the staff would like the, the council to consider if and when the council chooses to amend chapter 17.64. And this is the direction that we're gonna be asking the council to move forward with. Again, it's not a vote, it's just to see whether or not the council wants us to craft an ordinance to amend. If you, if the council is not amenable, we uh, staff is asking you to consider the following. Number one, allow limited short-term rental uses while preventing the loss of housing stock. Number two, preserve residential character and establish operating standards to reduce potential noise, parking, traffic, property maintenance, and safety impacts on adjacent neighbors. And number three, provide an enforcement mechanism for the city to track and enforce requirements as needed. So right now there is no enforcement mechanism in our ordinance to enforce permitting of um, transient use permits. We have no fine structure, no enforcement mechanism. So when we said there are 36 permitted, but 46 are active, there's no way for the city of Sonora it's beyond just sending letters that you're out of compliance for us to actually enforce the ability to ensure that they're, they are seeking permits and providing TOT revenue to the city. So when you look at allowing for limited short-term rental uses while preventing the loss of housing stock. We wanna look at what we kind of talked about earlier, which is some of the considerations that other jurisdictions have posed on those requirements is in re requiring a primary residency requirement. And we talked about host, hosted rental, and I kind of put those definition of terms there for you and unhosted rental, what that looks like. Um, and so the other jurisdictions that we saw in El Dorado County, Lake Tahoe, San Diego, they actually are establishing numerical limits to how many short-term rentals are within the city. So those are kind of the main differences we're seeing in jurisdictions. If they allow them, some are, allow, some are requiring primary residency and then others are putting numerical limits. And number three is limiting unhosted rentals where a homeowner resident is not staying the night. So again, if you are putting a primary residency requirement on a short-term uh, rental, the, most jurisdictions establish a, a, a limit, a number of days in which a property owner cannot be on site at a time. And in, in discussion in, um, in your staff report, I actually talk about staff has actually looked at a couple of different options. 120 days of required on-site seems to be kind of like a sweet, stop, sweet spot between cities. Um, and that's because here we have actual seasons, right? We have a summer season, we have winter seasons. Um, we have seniors that like to go for RG, RV trips around the country. Um, and so we wanted to ensure that 120 days would give an established amount of time for um, property owners to not be within their residency and to allow for a season. For instance, if there is a, a teacher who is um, on summer break for three months and wants to be able to take a vacation and allow rental of her, her, his, him or hers rental or residency, um, that summer would be allowable um, because of that 120 days. So those are a couple of different options. When we look at preserving residential character and establishing operating standards to reduce potential noise, parking, traffic, property maintenance, and safety inspections. We talked about what the ordinance already allows for, um, but one of the things that staff recommends is the city council to consider a prohibition on special events. So again, talking about those business uses that are not standard within a residential area. So special events would include weddings, corporate retreats, those types of activities that are not general within a residential neighborhood. Um, our on-site parking per, uh, requirement. So um, Rochelle talked about um, having a requirement of looking at um, on-site parking. Right now, we do not require on-site parking, but I know council members have talked about in the past, um, our parking situation in Sonora. We also do know that there are areas in Sonora that on-site parking is just not it's just not attainable. So staff would have to do a little bit more research on what areas, if the council so chooses, um, which areas would require on-site um, parking requirements. Trash collection. Um, it's not part of the current ordinance, but in looking at other jurisdictions, most cities and counties regulate that a uh, short-term rental 
um, operator must have an agreement with the franchisee holder um, for trash collection. So currently the city's franchisee holder is waste management. Um, so looking at a requirement that they have waste management established trash collection services and a prohibition on a collection of trash outside the facility. And then a fire safety requirement. Uh, and this is something that your fire chief's gonna talk about here in just a moment. Um, so when we're looking at other um, jurisdictions, they do have quite a bit of fire safety um, and fire inspection requirements. You know, we're looking at this as a business, just as a bed and breakfast or a hotel, they are required to pass occupancy um, inspections, hotels and bed and breakfasts. So uh, your fire chief is going to talk about fire safety considerations at this point. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members, members of the public that are still listening in. Um, so when the when the short term rentals first started, there wasn't a large amount, as Mary Rose had pointed out in the city, and there still is no regulation by the state fire marshal's office um, for this category. Uh, the hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts are actually mandated to have an annual inspection. Um, and so I think with this ordinance, my recommendation is to bring them up to the same playing field. It's not fair that our hotels, bed and breakfasts are getting inspected and have a, an annual fee charged to them for that inspection and the short term rentals are not and they're providing the same type of um, service by allowing someone to spend one or two nights or even a week, uh, just like our, our other um, hotels. So um, as Mary Rose put it, pointed out, um, our typical inspection is looking for smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, fire extinguishers, exits not blocked. Um, also that the address is clearly marked. So if we do have to respond there, people know what the address is and could give that to the 911 dispatcher to get us there quickly and be able to identify the house if there is a fire or an emergency. Uh, and then there's, a, there's an assortment of life safety regulations through the state fire marshal's office codes that we look at, like ex, um, extension cords being in use in lieu of permanent wiring or um, holes in the sheetrock into the, in the house or in the ceiling or something like that where a fire would be able to access and spread more rapidly. Um, so taking into uh, consideration our fire inspections, my recommendation would be have those be part of the short-term rental uh, ordinance as well. Also, we passed, the city passed in 2016, our ordinance 828, which is uh, unlawful and uh, open burning. And so my recommendation would also be that we would limit or regulate the type of open burning that would be allowed at these uh, short-term rentals. Um, right now, it would be basically uh, propane fireplaces, outdoor fireplaces, or natural gas, which we don't have, but propane fireplaces. Um, and there has to be certain clearances from vegetation around those uh, uh, fireplaces. Also, if you were using natural wood to barbecue or a warming fire um, for a fire pit in the backyard, it would still have some type of regulations, three feet from combustibles, 10 feet from structures. Um, and then the other thing I would recommend is our defensible space, that if we are allowing Airbnb or short-term rentals in the city is to make sure that they have to comply with an annual defensible space inspection. Uh, so they're not overgrown uh, and, and there's not a, an additional hazard uh, for people coming from outside of the area and are into a, a hazardous condition already. And then we, we have a fire that we definitely don't want to have. So um, I think that's basically all the, the things that we covered uh, in there and in the inspection process. So that would be my recommendation. So, and lastly, providing an enforcement mechanism for the city to track and enforce requirements, requirements as needed. And uh, number one is um, the creation of fines for both property owners and guests for non-compliance. Again, looking at other jurisdictions, um, it seems that both property owners and guests, there are fines associated with non-compliance of your transient uh, residential use permits in other jurisdictions. Um, and then also revocation of a property owner's transient use permit for continued violations and or non-compliance of a renewal application. And by this, I just wanna point out that um, the city of Sonora does require that we issue a renewal permit, um, but there are many um, permit holders that do not apply for re renewal permits. Um, and, um, you know, 
In fact, we had um, one recently that applied for six of their renewal permits. Um, they were due July 1st and they did not renew until March of this year. So a long-term, you know, where they're going without a, a renewal permit and we have no mechanism to try to enforce compliance of those types of um, requirements. So at this time, I will stop my, our presentation and entertain any um, discussion from the council. Again, I'm not looking for a vote. This is merely to look for direction in order for us to draft any type of ordinance if the council so chooses. I mean, um, we're looking, I know Doug and I spoke about this beforehand. Um, we're just gonna be looking at whether or not there is enough direction or enough of a majority of a council to even go about drafting any type of amendment. And if the council does provide direction to draft an, a, an ordinance, what that, what that ordinance would look like. Um, our, um, if the council so chooses to bring forth an amendment, um, staff would like to bring back a draft in June for the public to once again weigh in on any type of changes um, before it would go to planning commission um, sometime in the summer as well. So at this time I'll entertain any questions or any, I'm looking for any direction from council. Anyone want to go first? <laughs> well, as long as we get a second bite at the apple, go yeah. ahead. No. I, please, please, ladies first. <laughs> I don't agree with that, but thanks. Um, I actually just have a couple of questions. What is our hotel occupancy rate? Do we know that? Um, and I know I'm not supposed to, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm just throwing this out there because I don't expect you to really have that, know that off the top of your head, but I'm just wondering, if this Airbnb phenomena is killing our hotel industry. I'm sorry, Council Member were such, I don't know our hotel occupancy rates. Um, we would have to look at that and get back to you on that. I'm sorry, I, I, just, I just thought of that. Um, I think I had another question actually on here though. Uh, While well, she's thinking, okay. can I yep. uh, can I ask about the unpermitted um, uh, rent uh, active hosts right now? I mean, how do we how do we know that? How do you um, uh, uh, identify them and and you know where are they? <laughs> um, are they? I mean, are are they in general? Are they? I mean, the whole zoning thing is really kind of uh, you know it was hard to get my head around that, but um, um, uh, the uh, how have you identified the the unpermitted? Um... Sure. So the city contracts with a software company called Host Compliance. Is that correct, Chris? Right. And Host Compliance um, is a software vendor that many jurisdictions um, utilize to track Airbnb, VRBO, Home Away from Home, all those different types of hosting platforms to look for um, people advertising, property owners advertising um, short-term rentals within our jurisdiction. When a property is identified, we have the ability to look to see which properties are actively advertising on all of these different types of platforms. Um, when we notice that a property is advertising and does not have an active permit, host compliance then issues a letter. And do we do it as well, Chris, the city, or is it just host compliance? Yeah. So both the software company and also your community development department sends out a letter letting them know that they are out of compliance of um, chapter 17.64 and they must come into compliance. So that is all that we at, at this time can do. But again, again, we don't have any type of enforcement mechanism beyond that. Right. So they obviously haven't come in to get their permit. <laughs> no. Okay, anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Mayor Pertim. Thank you. Um, okay, somewhere, because maybe I was thinking, trying to grasp something else, but home occupation, does that just mean basically a normal renter? No, it's was, a business. It's a business right. within a residential okay, zone. Got, I missed that, and it seemed like it was important. Okay, how different are the rules for bed and breakfast? Well, I mean, I, I'm familiar with Beretta House. And, uh, these, a lot of these are essentially working in a very similar market. So are they governed by a different set of rules completely? Yes, they are. And Rochelle, 
do you want to talk about rules governing bed and breakfasts? I know you probably have a little bit more off the top of your head than I do. Okay. So as we talked about, there's specific zones where they're allowed by right. bed. Right. Hold on just a second, Rochelle, make sure your sound makes up. Go ahead. And there's other zones where they require a use permit. So um, if it's a use by, allowed by right, um, they get their business license, they have to meet the requirements of what a bed and breakfast is, which means you have to occupy it to be a bed and breakfast. Otherwise, it's an inn or a hotel. Okay. Um, so they... Um, so they have to meet that requirement in any of the building code requirements, uh, public health depend or environmental health if they're doing food. So they come into all of those um, items. Transient use is also required to deal with environmental health if they're going to offer meals at all, except for prepackaged stuff. So that, that can trigger for them as well. If it requires a use permit for a bed and breakfast, then they go through the use permit process depending and we evaluate the property you know, parking, we'd look at everything right. related to that. Okay. We'd um, make any conditions from police, fire, um, or any other, the other uh, departments as well as um, community development, we would look at it. Um, they would have to have a use permit to do that. Um, and, but if it's a use by loud by right, as long as they yeah. meet all the permitting requirements, yeah. then they do. They do not have to guarantee that somebody's over 18 staying there. They do not have to, um, a bed and breakfast, um, generally would have parking, you know, as part of their, um, but yeah, so it's just a little bit different. It's, um, they, yeah. but they do require that they, it's a, their residency, correct? They have to reside there and it's a commercial use and it's allowed in certain areas. So it's not, um, something that can just pop up anywhere. I mean, without, they have to have a business okay. license. We were are very aware of it ahead of time versus on these, they can be anywhere and we don't know they're there. Yeah. So to be clear, it's much more much more it, it much more closely resembles a hotel right than it does the, the a vacation the temporary vacation rental and how many b and b's do we have in the city roughly i mean plus or minus five or ten or four five that i'm thinking five, yeah because yeah. i'm only i know we just have the new one that cindy opened up that's the one on beautiful. green street and the yeah. one i mean and beretta gardens but. yeah we have knowles hill bed and breakfast we have bradford street we have yeah. um beretta gardens beretta gardens yeah. olive yeah. manor and okay. yeah i was just people. trying to get a rough idea and yeah because mm -hmm. one of my questions mm -hmm. obviously is yeah and, and that kind of follows up on councilwoman such as is the stock of available rooms. I mean, if, if we're just short of rooms, then we maybe need to be thinking about permitting a new hotel as well. Um, but I mean, that's a different topic, but if we need more rooms and if there's a market that's filling it, uh, we can do that. Okay. Um, I can tell you one of the big push behind our original ordinance was from the hotel bed and breakfast industry because they were very concerned about the fact that they were losing people to those facilities and they didn't they weren't regulated and they didn't have to pay any taxes so that's really was a big push be behind the original ordinance well that makes a lot of sense um and then so for oh rochelle no 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 rochelle oh sorry our city administrator you. so <laughs> with envisioned i mean we're going to have enforce well first the question i guess is most code enforcement is complaint driven is this going to be enforced differently or driven by complaint from neighbors and other people i mean somebody can't find so it would be so. it would be a couple of different ways so we would definitely still have the contract with host compliance which monitors those that are actively advertising um, on platforms that are not permitted. So we have that ability. And then the issues addressing parking and noise and so forth, that would be complaint driven. Um, and that's where we get complaints already from neighbors when it comes to parking and noise and so forth. Okay. So is- oh, no, hold on just a second. Uh, your fire chief wants to address oh, that please. as well. If you do include an annual inspection as part of the ordinance too, then that would be something that would catch any violations and enforcement right. as well. Okay, I, I, that's something I support because I think if you're running uh, many, many strangers through your house that we ought to have that up to the same standards. Uh, so then the, the enforcement 
question I had begs the rest the other half of it, and that is, uh, do we need new staff for because a lot of the a lot of the enforcement issues that we have are already in current ordinance, correct? And will our present if, staff or predicted staff be able to deal with a greater level of of expecting compliance without having to hire new people? Well, we already do. We already try to enforce right, at this right. point with the current level of staff. The ability is there's no, if you will, bite to that enforcement, mm -hmm. meaning there's no monetary you know, issue that people are seeing in exchange of that ordinance. So you're already, we're already paying for the software. We're already utilizing staff time to do enforcement, um, except for- So we don't envision needing new staff- I, I do not envision at this point- the way things look need, right now. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, so are, are we going, does this uh, have a public comment? component yes, okay yes, yes. because <clears throat> there are a couple other items i'd like to address but i'd like to listen to the public first yeah so I, i'll can i'll wait for my comments till after public comment if the unless the council has any more comments or questions okay so let's turn it over to public comment so at this time if you have public comment regarding this item please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature or dial star nine on a phone. And at this time, I see your first public comment is from the Hedges family. Go ahead. Excellent, go ahead, Hedges family. Hi, uh, my name is Ken Hedges and my wife, Kristen Hedges, she's inside right now. She was just out here, but um, I live on beautiful Bradford Street. Um, <laughs> in downtown uh, i've owned a home here for eight years and i've done a lot of things with it when we originally had it it was commercial use and we rented uh business two businesses you know mostly massage therapists and then at some point we revoked that commercial use permit and have since been um you know sort of in a house that was built as two units uh have have rented to other you know for various purposes actually for up until march of last year we had an airbnb for uh, about a year and hosted hundreds of guests in that in that year and and lived here at the same time uh we've also have have just rented to you know long-term lease families and uh i will admit openly that uh, every time we accept applications for at least the last six years we've gotten dozens and dozens of applications people looking for homes uh horrifying stories of you know people really struggling and and having a hard time in life and uh and i will admit that on a few times i've i've rented to those sorts of people and uh not that it always has to be that way but it was never generally a, a happy ending I've had some really scary situations with, uh, you know, not great tenants who who didn't, you know, respect the the property, and um, and then again we've had other, you know, good situations. Although, you know, uh, those are the situations where we're a little more diligent about the applications we go through and who we want to rent to. And uh, but in considering the Airbnb, uh, you know the transient use i would say that the current ordinance is, is pretty effective obviously uh, enforcement that's a hard thing to deal with i it, it hurts kind of when we did an airbnb for you know that that year and you know we're paying 10 percent in uh taxes you know filing every every month to the city and to know that you know we would look we would see on airbnb you know the people who were seconds. sort of renting but not not uh you know permitted not doing the right thing um i would just suggest that you keep in uh instead of limiting people who rent their primary residence maybe um not because you know we have a wonderful time renting to uh foreign nationals that come to visit our wonderful little town and it's it's a fun way to rent rooms in your house rather okay. than having to open it up. Time's to, up, sir. All right. Have a good night, you guys. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much. Your next public speaker is from Mike Rossi. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, I'm more confused about the, um, I'm, I'm clear on the 30 days transient use, but I'm um, unclear about the rental policy, longer term rental policies, um, you know, that you're uh, imposing. So is it over 30 days is uh, a long term rental? Is that the rule? Uh, we will. I we will be addressing that. Unfortunately, with the public comment, we're not going to answer any questions. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So, so I'm I'm unclear about the uh, the policy between thirty days and uh, one year. Okay. We will answer that question at the end of or after public comment is over with. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then your your next public comment, Mr. Mayor, is just from either a two or a double L or the second, one of those things. Okay. I'll call it double L. So I would just like to say that um, many people want choices when they come to our city. Many people might not like hotels and they might not like Airbnbs. We have 2,700 residential units you mentioned, um, and I would, really like to know how many of those are full-time rentals. This city does have a lot of rented homes. Um, people just don't move. I know I have at least 35% of my neighborhood as rentals. And I know if you were to go up Stewart or up uh, by the dome, it's probably more like 70% of those residential units are rentals. So um, we are ambassadors to our guests when they come from all over the country and all over the world. And some people prefer that kind of experience. So um, I would think that you should just go on with your current ordinance and make sure that people stay in compliance, but I don't think you need any more restrictions than that. You know, we are not the coast and we are not the Bay Area. Um, I live, you talked about regulations and, and your zoning. I live in an R3 zone and, and there's a morgue there now. Um, are you regulating that? So I suggest you just stick with what you're doing and, and have it be that. Thank you. Thank you, D double L or double I. That was, that was kind of cool, actually. Uh, your next speak public speaker is from Pablo Lopez. Pablo, go ahead, Pablo. Cool, thank you. Um, so you're going to hear probably from a lot of people, you know, um, fighting for deregulating this, right? Um, and I understand that people have a right to business and rentals are important. It's a lucrative business. But I'd like to re remind the council that housing is a fundamental right. And there's currently a housing issue, a huge housing issue in California, right? The housing issue has three main parts. One is the homeless population, right? In Tuolumne County, in the plan to combat homelessness, in the report from May 29th, they, the PIT report said that there's currently about 418 homeless people in Tuolumne County. 26% of those are youth, right? We're talking under 18. Um, that entails 14% being children, 12% trans uh, transitional age, 14% of the total are seniors, 66 are adults, right? So these homeless population, uh, I think it's important to put a face to it. It's not just like numbers, right? These are people. Uh, second is that there is a poverty line um, of people that have homes, but they're not really living, right? They're just barely surviving. The Sonora poverty rate is 20.99% compared to the national average, which is 11.8. More than half of the income um, is going for, you know, housing and basic needs. You know, people don't really um, have a way to find affordable locations to live. Um, and then really the last thing is that 60 years ago, the average California home was three times the average household income. Now it's seven times, right? Um, when you expand businesses like this, where you allowed uh, the rentals and you allow people, yes, to make more money, right? To bring more people in. You're also taking residential places for people, right? It increases the market in a way that it boosts the prices of housing and makes it harder to rent and makes it ha harder to own. I think it's important 
that yes, people have ability to choose when they travel, where they want to stay, but also that you remember that in representing the community, um, you know, there's people that you need to protect. I think that attaching a 1% um, quota to it, right? 1% of the total houses that are available be limited to this. That makes sense. That's protection for the community. And I would hope that the council, you know, goes in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Your next public speaker, Mr. Mayor, is from Karen Wood. Okay, go ahead, Karen. I just want to share, I am an Airbnb host in the county, um, and I also have a family member that struggles to find affordable housing in the city. So um, I personally see both sides of this, but I just wanted to share one piece of information is that in the county, the county has a relationship with Airbnb and the transient tax is just automatically paid from Airbnb directly to the county. I'm not involved in it. I don't have to fill out any forms or make sure it's sent in. And I just, I think that that would be an interesting thing to look at if you're continuing with short-term rentals so that the city is guaranteed to receive that kind of money because um, Airbnb does offer that as an option. Okay, hey, thank you, Karen. Your next public speaker is from John Luxy or Luxy? Luxy, John Luxy. He has a owns a house actually down the street from me. Hi there. Thank Go ahead, you. John. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um I just I'm just trying to you said a mouthful, a, a lot of information. I was taking notes as fast as I can. And I have Airbnbs in town and I'm I'm uh I'm I think one of the one of the ways I like to respond is that they, a lot of the areas that you mentioned that you're using in the rest of California, I don't, I don't think is very much like Sonora. You mentioned uh, Carmel and, and the 1% that San Diego is doing, which is very different than Sonora and Tahoe, limiting, uh, limiting their amount of rentals there. And... Um, I mean, like, like, like Tahoe has Marriott's and casinos and um, places to stay and do. It's, it's just, I, I think we're looking at really, what I'm hearing is we have 36 vacation rentals and 10 illegal ones, or maybe a, almost a third of them are illegal now. That would be a, a thing that would certainly would address. Um, but I don't think we have this problem because all the examples are coming not so much from our town and, and but from these other towns that I don't, I don't think are anywhere like us. Um, and I'm concerned and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak and I'm going to take action with everything I got here because based on the recommendations I heard that um, I believe you said that, that I must be on site of any Airbnb, that's this is my livelihood. So what I heard tonight is it's it's over for me if you were to adopt the suggestions uh, that that were recommended to you, um, based on me having to be on site. Which is it, I had never had a guest. I don't know. Some people like to stay like with other people, but like when I go, I'm trying to get away with my family and be alone. I, it seems like a conflict there for, for a lot of people to stay with someone else and, and have them be there. Why, why you're staying, even though there might be a separate room or you got to share a bathroom. So I, I don't see that I don't, uh, as, a, as a positive thing for tourism in this town. Um, and uh, just a, a lot of different, uh, I'm just hearing a lot of negative things, the vacation rentals. I haven't, I can count on one hand, probably that in seven years I've been doing them. Um, it's been a wonderful experience of people. I wish I could show you the thousands of reviews. In fact, I'd like to of the people that love this town, love the place they're staying. And I, I don't think you should shut them down or, or me down um, entirely as, as what you're doing if you take these recommendations uh, as spoken. So that's all I have for now. You'll hear more from me. Thank you. Thank you. Your, ne your next public speaker is from Matt Zielinski. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Matt. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, council members, thank you, Matt Zielinski. I spoke at the April 5th meeting in regards to my situation. Um, we all know that the housing crisis is not directly related to the 2% uh, transient residential use in, in Sonora. 
there are bigger issues out there that are creating these things. There's state mandates, there's COVID-19, there's people moving out of the big cities to come to the rural areas to get away from all that stuff. There are people that are able to work from home nowadays because of technology that they wanna get out of the big cities. So these are positive things that are creating uh, residential problems possibly. There's retirement, the boomers are retiring, getting away from big cities. What we need is more housing. That's all there is to it. Our little Airbnb little community is not destroying what is happening in this community. We need to get with developers, get some affordable housing on the market, get some good permit streamlined processes and make it to where there's incentives for a developer to come in here and correct the problem. Uh, housing is not, the housing issue is not gonna go away once these mandates are in effect. Uh, there's a lot more things going on here. I agree with your proposed ordinance on the amendments. I agree with your enforcement mechanisms. I don't agree with your 120 day unhosted Airbnb rule. That is not gonna solve a housing crisis. There's not one person that's gonna own a house and have a renter in there for 245 days out of the year and have to evict them because they wanna Airbnb out the other 120 days. That makes no sense to me. And with your stats, there's 25% of the Airbnbs are homeowners, 25%, nine of them. So the other 75%, you're going to take right out of the market just by that rule. I think it's kind of ridiculous rule. I think it needs to be reevaluated. Um, and I think maybe it's, it's uh, your social equity committee might need to look at that paragraph in there. I appreciate all your hard work. I appreciate and recognize that there is possibly a, a huge problem or a potential problem. I think you need to spend a little bit more time on it and not make any knee jerk decisions. Um, like all the other people that talked before me, um, I agree with Double L, what she said. I agree with John Lucy, uh, Karen Wood, Mike Rossi. 30 seconds. I'm not so sure I agree with Pablo Lopez because I don't think we're hurting the, uh, your growing homeless population and low income and affordable housing needs that is defined as the problem. Um, I do appreciate all your hard work. Keep up the good work. Um, and hopefully you guys can come to a fair and, and reasonable decision. Thank you. Thank you. Your next speaker is from Zelensky. No, it's a different, different one. Zelensky. They're a big family. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Cindy. Hi, this is Cindy Zelensky. Um, thank you for address addressing this issue. I know that for a while now we have been kind of skirting around a lot of these different things. Um, I agree. We have a housing issue in Tuolumne County. We just do. I don't believe the housing problem per se is from the 47 Airbnbs that are in the city of Sonora. Tuolumne County is much bigger than that. Um, one of the issues I feel like that we truly have is lack of rules and regulations to follow ways to track it, ways to manage it, to understand that we are actually providing. Um, we talked about the homeless population and how the Airbnbs are affecting that. There's not a correlation, in my opinion, to those things. Um, I personally have family members who are homeless. I'm very tied into our homeless community. That is not the huge reason people are homeless right now, at least in our area and with the people I've talked to. What the problem is, is our zoning issues. Tuolumne County has been notorious, not just Sonora, I'm not blaming this on Sonora. Tuolumne County in general has been way behind so many other cities. Until we look at our general plan and start looking at how we can develop affordable housing for our community we're gonna be continuing to look at this and putting band-aids on things that don't need band-aids. When I look at the Airbnbs in Tuolumne County, it is bringing in a huge revenue for the local businesses. I look at our restaurant. We see probably between 100 and 300 people a day. And we're talking to them, we're asking them where they're from. There really isn't a ton of places for them to stay in downtown Sonora. So we ask if it's affecting our lodging. Somewhat, it's making our lodging better. 
we have to be more competitive. We have to look and make sure we're providing things that people are wanting. Downtown Sonora does not have a lot of that, unfortunately. Um, so as we are getting better at our jobs in our industry, the Airbnbs have actually helped us um, fill a need. When our customers are coming in and talking to us, they really are talking about- seconds. Thank you. Um, how much they are loving our little community. One of the things I'd really hope for, put together a good ordinance, put together some really good rules, figure out what your, your standard base is going to be and let's work on that as a community and, and move forward. But let's look on our zoning and our general plan. We are not gonna fix our homeless. We're not gonna fix any of these issues until we really start looking at how we are addressing uh, where people are living, how they're living. Uh, and how they're using time's up, Cindy. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Your next public speaker is from Rachel Beckham. Go ahead, Rachel. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for all the Airbnbs or short-term rental people that spoke. Um, I'm someone that would like to make my current home an Airbnb, um, not as a, a full-time Airbnb, but partial, partial um, part of the year. I love this town. And when I'm in my home, I love it. When I'm not here, I would love to rent it out and have other people enjoy this beautiful city. And I just think if um, as a city, as a community, we come together and make um, rules, I definitely think there should, they should be regulated so everybody's safe. And, um, you know, what you have now I think is good and maybe having, as you mentioned, fees for people not complying, that makes sense. But when it comes to the homeless and rental shortage, um, the housing crisis, I just honestly, just like many of you have already brought up, I just don't think that's going to solve the problem. Um, I think it, Eric, these short-term rentals actually help the city of Sonora. I think it brings good families here that bring, um, you know, positive, memories, relationships, and they tell other people about it and they wanna come and visit. And I just see a short-term rentals also gets people in, they enjoy the city and then they go home. And, and it's just a positive experience. And for me as a homeowner, I, I look at it as, I, it gives me, I, I'm hoping in the future, some income to um, maintain my property. You know, I own it on my own. So I just see it as, you know, something I can do to help maintain it, to make sure it looks nice. I, I love to walk around this um, city. So I see Airbnb homes and I know which ones are, you know, which ones are Airbnbs and they look great. You know, they, the, the, everything's always, the landscape looks nice, the homes look nice. And so I think what is going on now currently is working um, as for the way they look. And I just, I mean, honestly, I just don't think it's going to solve the main reason to have more ordinances or more regulations um, for the shortage of housing and rentals, I'm, especially for someone, seconds. someone like me that would like just to make some extra income to um, keep my house up or maybe even to keep my home. <laughs> so, um, but thank you for everyone sharing that currently has an Airbnb. It's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Your next public speaker is Mike Callahan. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, hi there, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a few rentals downtown. Uh, my business partner and I, John Lutzi, and uh, I, you guys have had this a lot of information that you guys have compiled tonight. And some of the things that I think that everybody needs to think about is, you know, has the city been receiving a lot of complaints about vacation rentals? Like, has this been a problem? Um, you know, that was cited in these studies, you know, that there's a nuisance, there's noise, there's parking, there's all these issues. And has that been an issue? Because I can say that in our rentals, we haven't had any of those problems. Um, so I think that needs to definitely be considered if that's one of the reasons you guys are considering doing what you're doing. Um, 
obviously if you guys know that there's rentals out there that are not paying TOT and they are not permitted, then if you know they're there, then why are those not being shut down? I mean, that's a given, right? Um, there, you know, there's a case study that Mary had on a rental house that had a lot of interest. It wanted 1400 bucks a month and people were willing to pay more than, than she was asking. And that's one house from one person. So that's not, I mean, come on, you guys got to look into it a little deeper than that. Um, all these examples, these other towns that you guys are using for, uh, you know, comparison, Tahoe and uh, Carmel. I mean, this is Sonora. You know, it's a great town, but man, we got to be happy with what we got here and uh, take some of this stuff that is positive and that people are coming here for and run with it and be happy we have it. I mean, I watched the city of Sonora drive away Doug Kennedy and all the stuff he was trying to do. And I mean, geez, that building is just still sitting there vacant. And who knows when that's going to turn into something. But it's like some somebody's got to do something around here. And, you know, all these Airbnb people, they're trying to do that. You know, they're making great environments for people. People obviously like them because they're coming. They're bringing money. They're leaving it. Then they go home. They're not leaving trash like all the people up at Little Sweden. You know, I mean, they're they're all good people we want in town. So seconds. Why are we kicking them out? And why are we kicking all the Airbnb hosts out? You know, I mean, obviously you have to have some controls on it. And, uh, you know, what the fire department's talking about doing, these are all logical things. But as far as revoking existing permits, that's crazy. I mean, you're talking about people's livelihoods and businesses that they've already created. And then you guys are just going to grab them and run with it. So I think you guys need to think about it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, Mr. Mayor, I do not see any additional public comment. Okay. First of all, thank you to everyone that called in. Thank you very much. Um, and then I will ask the council if they have any discussion, questions. Everyone's still processing. So I guess I'll, I wrote down a couple notes here. Um, one gentleman had commented about unclear the 30 days or one year. It was, it's short term Airbnb. It's so it's, we're addressing 30 days. Generally, and I don't know from a legal perspective, Doug, if you want to talk about that, but generally a short term rental is defined as a, a rental of 30 days or less. So your longer term leases are those that come into 30 days or more. They're looking at is it from a residential perspective, short term rentals are your vacation rentals. So those are generally, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies really bad. Um, <clears throat> 30 days or less. And I don't know if you want to talk about from a legal perspective, Doug. Yeah, it's generally speaking 30 days or less because they don't want them to establish tenant rights that would be subject to having to get them formally evicted and things of that nature. Okay, that answers that question. Uh, another comment was made about uh, streamlining the permit process. Uh, that was one of our council goals, making things a little easier. Um, so that's, that is, that part is being addressed. Uh, Rochelle, I, I know I've asked you this question publicly, but it was brought up again. How many people, have there been any corporations, anyone come to us about building a hotel? No. Okay, so there's... Okay, so... Yeah, yeah, if you could come up. We have not. We have had people that have our property owners that have looked at the possibility of reaching out to hotel operators about building on their property, and we've encouraged that. Um, and we also have the Sonora Inn who's doing a major renovation mm -hmm. of his of his motel right now, and we do have others that are, and hopefully more will, because we would like them to improve as well. The the one on Stockton, I know, um, I can't remember the name of it, but um, they just went through a big process and. Uh, cleaned up their their place and got a lot of new investment in with, within the last year or so, correct? Yeah, that's the Gold Lodge. The Gold Lodge, yes. Yeah, they um, they have. Um, um, people can always do better. Yes. So um, we encourage our hotels to, um, you know, 
like Jeff's doing at the Sonora Inn. The the better your facility is, the more people want to stay there. Yes. Okay. Um, there was one one comment about problems. I know I've been contacted about several problems with uh, Airbnbs or an Airbnb down the street, and usually it's it's an absentee owner. It's of, of an Airbnb. It's not one of the names who have popped up and spoke tonight. Um, I've talked to several people that spoke tonight, and I mean, I, I they run a great business. They're honest. I'm not going to put anyone specifically's name out there, but I'm, I've, I've talked to several and. There's been no issues, but because there have been issues, there was one group that came in, the one that um, didn't renew seven of their seven of their permits. Six of their six permits. permits, excuse me. And they were giving city staff a really hard time. And that's one of the reasons this is in front of us now. And it's not just getting loud, it's it's really, really getting abrasive. And I'm not gonna go into details, but that's one of the reasons this is in front of us. Um, Mike, you had made a comment about there were no problems with one of your rentals. There was. Um, it took three police calls to get partying stopped. So if you need to talk to me about that, I'll be glad to fill you in. But, um, you know, that that is a fact. Actually, three or four police calls over a two, two-week period. Um, and then, you know, me personally, I've talked to several of you. Um, you know, I'm for very pro-business. Um, I think everyone should be treated fair and have access if they want to do an airbnb everyone should follow the same guidelines that's for me personally my goal in seeing all this talked about is not um not running any area airbnb host out because i get it there's livelihoods um i also get the housing shortage too and we've got supposedly 46 short-term rentals that's not going to cause solve if we outlawed them all today that's not going to solve our housing crisis um, it's just not, it's impossible. The, the only way to solve our housing crisis is more investment in the community, whether it be apartments, whether it be homes, something like that. And then obviously having another hotel or two, um, th that's going to take care of a lot of our uh, issues. But, um, right now, 46 short-term rentals, it, it's, it, we could outlaw all those. It's not going to take care of the issue. Um, but, you know, again, I'll just say it, you know, there is, I don't want to run anybody out of business. That's not the goal here. And that's, at least I, I would hope that wouldn't be the rest of the council's goal to run people out of business. I haven't seen that from this council. So I think that's all that I have. I may have more in a minute. We'll see. All right. I think well, we're going to want a, something of a discussion with back and forth and not yeah. just one go at the apple. And mm -hmm. Well, nobody else yeah, wants to go for it, so I want to give a, give a few things out there, get some things out there that need to be said, too. There was, there was another question about the, the Airbnb and the, um, the how the county was able to include it and the city doesn't, it can't. The, the, the TOT tax and oh, yeah. getting yeah. Airbnb to... Yes. So uh, the city has tried many, many, times. many times to engage with Airbnb to enter into a contract where Airbnb um, would therefore then take TOT uh, revenue from your hosts on their platform. Rem remember, there are more than just Airbnb. So you would have to enter into contracts with Airbnb, VRBO, Home Away From Home, and all those other ones. Airbnb at this time does, is not engaging with any small communities. Um, and it is, uh, in fact, they won't even return phone calls to be able to engage in type of a contract. So <clears throat> while your city staff has tried on numerous occasions to engage Airbnb, they are um, not engaging with us at this point. Yeah, I just wanted to make that clear because that's been a contention for years now, why the county can uh, include their TOT tax in their uh, Airbnb, but they won't include the city. And um, Airbnb doesn't, won't, won't even, engage so we're too small apparently um so a couple of thoughts i had if i can keep going um go for it um you know it, it seems to me that um uh rent short-term rentals in a residential area should should follow the same laws that uh, a homeowner would have to follow or a bit a homeowner that has a business has to follow um and there are some regulations i see that that it, it, it doesn't seem to be doing that it doesn't appear that they don't have to follow some of those things so i, I agree with that concept 
um, you, you know, when you when you buy a home, you expect to have the 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 rules of the zoning that in the area that you that you bought your home in. And when we did the what is it? I, I forget the term, but it's it's in here. Um, the home home based businesses. Home, it, home occupancy. Home occupancy uh, for the businesses, other businesses. Um, they have to have the six trips a day type of thing or the whatever the other regulations are. And it, when we passed the, uh, the first um, short term rental ordinance, it seemed like it was a little more lax. And, and, you know, I would think that if you're a homeowner in that area, you want those ancillary businesses that are not renting out to, to, tur to tourists or whatever that have to follow that. I would think that that um, those the folks that actually rent out um, in the short-term rental market should also have to be um, those regulations should apply to them as well. So it should be a fair playing field um, in that respect. I also definitely b b b uh, agree with uh, that we need a, a, a enforcement mechanism because apparently we can't. There's some things we just can't enforce. Um, properly without the, the mechanism. So I'm definitely, definitely agree that we should have some sort of, of um, um, mechanism. And I'll just kind of stop there and let add someone else. Goodbye. Anybody else like to talk? <laughs> okay, council member Sutch. I'm <clears throat> I don't, I don't think anybody wants to put an existing business um, or Airbnb owner out of business. I do think that there is, um, there is a strong argument, however, for a moratorium on any more. Um, because although Airbnb does not, did not create our housing um, crisis, it has certainly contributed to it. Um, 46 homes, um, if we have, if, if there are, I don't think that, there, that we have, I know that we have 46 Airbnbs, but that doesn't mean that, that we lost 46 homes, but we've lost a lot of homes. And I speak as a landlord, I um, have two, rent, uh, two homes that we rent. And we, there was a consideration about Airbnb, but we decided that we felt better about providing a home. You know, there are houses, but there's someone else's home. And that really um, cre creates a, that's the tapestry of our town and our neighborhoods. And um, so I certainly think permitting, fining if people are not compliant or that they lose the right to have an Airbnb. Um, but certainly I would support limiting, um, coming up with a, a fair process to limit f future purchases. Because the other thing that, that buying these small homes that are throughout Sonora is that we're buying um, and, and flipping them into Airbnbs that we're buying the um, young first, um, the young homeowners ability to get into the housing market um, or we're, we're um, removing rentals that young people could rent. So we're, we're losing workforce rentals um, so, I mean, that all has to be considered. And I think we have certainly a responsibility to protect housing or housing in, in Sonora. So that's it for me. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Council Member uh, Um, You know, I, um, I, I don't think it's, you know, um, anyway, I looked, I looked at a lot of, I thought comparable towns to Sonora that had a uh, tourism base and what uh, what their city councils were doing uh, in terms of um, of trying to you know limit uh, limit the well I wouldn't say degradation but at least the integration of, of, of Airbnbs into the residential areas and in, in the downtown areas as well and um, I mean, it's it's kind of a universal problem now in tourist, uh, you know, tourist destination towns. Um, I certainly think that we need to beef up our um, our enforcement, uh, especially with the ten homeowners that apparently um, are doing business without a business license, and um, 
and you know and and impacting the other 36 that are um, that are permitted uh, and I think that we might consider maybe uh, capping the number of permits that um, the city um, uh, the city uh, offers and um, there might be, you know, I mean, when when one host leaves, then there's an opportunity for another to come in. But maybe we we cap it for a while just to see, you know, how that works. Um, but uh, I certainly don't think we need to do anything retroactive to the um, the homeowners who are now um, Airbnb hosts. Um, however, we, you know, I think the uh, off street parking should be enforced, and, um, and certainly the fire. Um, the fire code uh, recommendations, uh, especially um, clearance around the house because the fire is such a great danger here. So um, I think that's my input for right now. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for being gracious enough to go first in part because I really have come into this open-minded. Uh, there are problems and difficulties with both or all sides of the, of the issue. Um, and I've got it as 0.5, but I would first start with the housing crisis that we have here. And I think this is where we need to join with some of our other rural counties and other organ, organs and start lobbying Sacramento to make it easier to build houses. We don't want handouts, but we need rules so that developers can build homes for working people that, that are affordable. And when we say affordable, I, I don't know of a term of art that means not low class, just nice homes that working working stiffs like me could envision buying. I've been a renter, a homeowner, and a landlord at one time, and they all have their unique difficulties, but we need more housing stock more than anything. So uh, both of our council ladies mentioned not wanting to basically go backwards and I, I think the term I would use would be we want to grandfather in our current uh, users and essentially business models. Um, and I, if that's, if that's not misinterpreting what you said, I support that and think that uh, for the people in business and I would even extend it to the businesses who have put in applications. I know that that can raise some hackles, but we, one of the, one of the big points that we need to, well, that I would like to emphasize, we don't need to do anything, uh, is that we have wanted to be able to help business and show good faith to our local business community for as long as I've been on this council. And it's often very hard to do in concrete terms. And, but in this, where we have people investing millions, in, I mean, as a, in aggregate into a structure that they think is predictable. And I think we have a moral obligation not to pull the rug on, under their, from under their feet and change the rules for people who and I'm thinking of Marianne Wright, for example, who I guess is no longer going to do it, but she wrote an eloquent letter to the effect that she didn't build up her, her business or an Airbnb because it was during COVID. And I think that there are a lot of people who have slowed down on plans and development. And uh, this is one area where I think we ought to consider respecting that in our business community. Uh, I did have a question still for staff and my impression is, is that the 120 day maximum use, is that just, did we pick that just because a lot of other areas have picked that or you chose come up with that as a? 
No, yes. so that's based on whether or not <clears throat> when you're looking at um, uh, requiring a primary residency of an Airbnb, 120 days is, is more or less <clears throat> the ability to um, rent out a season, if you will, okay. because there are, there are, you know, we have Teachers. definable seasons yep. in the city of Sonora. We have winter, okay. we have summer. Okay. Um, and because listening to the public call in that, you know, um, like I believe one of our public commenters was on the line that said, you know, they are an educator. They, they need mm -hmm. the ability to rent out during the summer of a primary residence. Most jurisdictions in the coast and in the and in the, and in the south, um, and I know some people talked about that we're not very compatible to that. Um, do not allow you to go beyond 200, 275 days. You've got to be within that residency. Some it's 180 days. Okay. Um, so it's it's a myriad of different um, versions, but okay. because of the distinct nature of Sonora, we thought if the council so chose is looking at a primary residency, that would make sense dependent on our seasons here in Sonora. Thank you. And my understanding from my reading is that for people who live in the home, like one of like the gentleman from Bradford Street, where if that we're not going to limit, or at least that's my impression, we're not envisioning limiting people who are actually living in the home and just letting out a room. That's uh, dependent on what the council right, would okay. want. Okay. It would, I, I would also say, I'd have to look at the specifics of that circumstance because of the way that he described it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether or not it constitutes a duplex or- Okay, well- so, was, so there's some nuances there. Yeah. Well, my understanding from my reading had been that we would allow, Probably, I mean, that we're envisioning not anymore going forward as, as what owner, well, I forget the term of art, but where the owner isn't present. Unhosted uh, rental? Yes, unhosted. Exactly. For those that, that are- that Hosted rentals, would we would still allow that to conceivably be a growth area and that's an area where I think that we, I mean, it kind of bridges the gap where if there is a need, then people who are not giving up a home, they're still living there, but that they, they can add to it. And to some degree, if it's not causing problems with the neighbors, then we're adding to our community. We get roughly half a million dollars in TOT which is a big deal. We don't want to shut this down if it's not otherwise damaging our residential zones. So just because I, I'm trying to get direction I'm from, sorry. Each, from each of you. So okay. what I'm hearing you say, Mayor Pro Tem Plummer, is you would not like to see any limit on those homes that are considered a primary residency that has an air or excuse me, a short term rental within a primary residency. Is that what I'm hearing from you? I don't know about no limits, but I think that if no if, no numerical limit, no cap on the amount, no moratorium on on short term rentals that are that are considered a primary right. residence. And I did define that within your right. staff report. We said a primary residence where the homeowner usually lives can provide evidence such as a driver's license, income yes. tax statement, or property tax statement with a homeowner's exemption. So yeah. that would be somebody who's not a second home, it would be right. a primary. Yeah. For example, if I, I mean, I've got two extra rooms with my girls gone and they're separate. I could conceivably do that. I don't want to, but. I, I think the other issue is just to be very clear and make sure there's no confusion. It would be, I think the recommendation would be, Mary Rose can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, during times that they're actually present. So what you don't okay, want is right. somebody who. Exactly goes on the road full time across the country and okay yes that's what i'm envisioning where they are renting a room for a weekend but are there as well i mean and the people i have known doing it were in that model and it it, it kind of filled a need while at the same time <clears throat> wasn't depriving anyone um so one of the other areas that had been suggested is maybe considering slightly different rules for different areas, specifically the downtown 
commercial, well, the old town corridor. And I'm just throwing that out there. I'm really interested in what the rest of the council has to say or thinks about it. This is another one of Marianne's suggestions. And I think it, I think it has some merit, but I'm pretty open-minded on it because there might be good arguments that I haven't thought of. Um, I did have a question on our actually current ordinance for our attorney, if we could, and this would be page 111 and the antipenultimate paragraph C, where it says a transient use parcel or any other location owned by the owner applicant has been a site of a violation of any provision of law uh, as a reason for permit denial or revocation. Does any, I mean, can a parking ticket be enough reason by this language to revoke somebody's permit? Can you, you went, Awfully quick for me. What, where are you at, real quick? What section? Oh, well, C. Uh, okay, seventeen sixty four one fifty permit den denial or revocation, and then uh, uh, paragraph but, but, C. Sorry, because we made a change on there, so their packets are slightly different. But if you look on, it's oh, right there. I'm sorry. So C at the bottom. It's the antepenultimate paragraph. No, this is um, this is specific to the parcel. So this wouldn't be for a traffic tip, uh, ticket. Um, this would be specific to the parcel or the owner who um, owned a parcel was used as a transit use that had a problem. So this would be more along the lines of what the mayor was indicating where maybe you had three, somebody was partying and it took multiple okay. police well, officers to come out there and it, be, and it, and it went from being a um, one call situation to being what maybe would constitute a neighborhood nuisance. And then that might affect their ability to, okay, to have well, so that ability. I can see. It's just when I see any uh, violation of any provision of law, there's lots of law that is really minutia. And yeah, I will say that don't take what we have as being gospel because okay. based off of the feedback that you get that you're giving, which unless I'm misunderstanding is going to be that we're going to come back with a new ordinance. Right. then I expect that there's going to be a fairly significant rewrite okay. of the entire section. Um, and so um, I would welcome a little clarification on that. Particular yeah, no, one. No, no. just because du I, duly noted. Um, and then I also support an enforcement mechanism. See, I like I think probably most of us didn't realize that we had no enforcement mechanism available. Um, my native start though is to have it progressive so it's not draconian from the beginning for for certain violations. See, if somebody hasn't been applying for permits, I've got no problem. I mean, forever, then I've got no problem with saying, well, okay, these were pretty clear rules and we're not going to allow this going forward, period. That's one way to approach it. And I wouldn't have a problem with that. If somebody else has, um, it, it's easy to fall into a close to bad situation, either with neighbors or personality conflicts. And any way that we can, I don't like coming down with a heavy hand as anything early and, and, and I mean, it hasn't been the case. I'm just saying, this is my opinion and I've talked for way too long, so. I, I think just based off of how we would approach this is, I mean, you would deal with different situations differently. Mm -hmm. Obviously you would be much more heavily handed with somebody who was um, not registering with the city, not exactly. getting a permit, not yeah. paying TOT and effectively operating right. illegally. Than somebody who maybe um, 
didn't get the license numbers for all of the cars that correct <laughs> correct I, I think a bigger issue that you're gonna if, if you're going in the direction of grandfathering I think one of the big issues that, that comes off is what happens when somebody is delinquent in their uh, permit renewal and whether or not they then lose that right or what the, mm -hmm. what you would envision and for doing that so I mean I think that what what, what, what council all goes I, I think maybe Mary Rose and I will have a few questions that we would like to ask okay. so that we make sure that we bring back something okay. that is reflective of what council you know actually wants because there's some nuances to this yeah I was okay. gonna say we have we've had recently um a particular property where the permit has not been renewed since 2017 yes, yeah, wanting good. the property to be renewed so yeah you know I mean that that's not a minor issue or a minor oversight and yeah. that's pretty obvious um so when as you were talking i had something had come to mind and as soon as i opened my mouth it left with if i may to start crafting some direction um if, do i have a majority of council members that want to see an amendment to the current chapter 17.64 yes okay so i've got a majority of that um, I also heard from four council members, Mayor, I did not hear from you about grandfathering, if you will, the current permit holders, which, which total 36 to exempt them from additional um, modifications of amendment of chapter 17.64. So, so no, I, I think that was to allow them to keep the permit. To yeah, allow them to keep would, them, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, yeah, sorry. Not necessarily to exempt them. No, they would no, still no. be, I'm sorry. But yeah, if you wanted to put any limitations on numbers or residency or, or any of that. Okay, so do I have, um, so we'll also have to look at though. Um, okay. Yeah, I think if they, if they, turned in their paperwork and as long as they've done the right thing then i don't so see any the other reason. question becomes uh, mayor pro tem plumber stated he wanted the ones that um rushed if you will to get applications in after council took direction on may 15th to be able to allow those I believe it's six applications that we've received since nine. nine applications since march 16th to be incorporated into so in addition to the 36 uh, of those of those nine three are from the same business owner so do wh what is the council pleasure sure. on that in addition to the 36 45 right 45 yep so so they're trying so the nine are trying are now do putting all their uh, paperwork in to become current yeah uh, no to get a new permit to get a new permit. Yes. See, so they haven't had a permit yet. And that's a big difference. But they yeah, that, did it after the moratorium. Yeah, so, the moratorium so, was effective March 16th. So it was it was applications received after um, from March 16th onward. So, so, so let me be very clear on this. So we have 36 permits. These are people who, these are parcels that have actually received permits, meaning that they have been approved, correct? You have nine folk. They are, current. are those 36 all current? Uh, no, I think a couple of them are inactive. They have not got renewals. Wasn't there a couple of them that don't take a permit? Yes. Yeah, so I would say that of those 36, there are a couple that are inactive. They didn't get a renewal because they were waiting to see COVID. So we still kind of look at them as as a third as a established yeah. Yeah. grandfather yes <clears throat> so 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 you have the 36 you have nine applicants so these are people who have turned in applications but those applications have not been reviewed or approved as of march 16th because they came after the deadline well it's not so much just the deadline it's it's that we quit processing them until we mm -hmm. get, we got direction yeah from the from the council so we accepted the application we didn't, they never reached a final conclusion or in or were they ever granted a permit. Mm -hmm. And that was pending council's review of what it wanted to do with this ordinance. So staff effectively, um, uh, you know, took in the application and waited for council direction before moving forward with it. So the- I said that six of those were- required. No, no. Mm -mm. Those would be new ones. Those would be absolute new ones. 
So the other thing you have to consider is, you know, there will probably be more that will come in after tonight if you add additional new ones. So you would have to establish an additional cutoff day. Right now, our cutoff day is March 16th. And, and, and yeah, it would it would get tricky. And I think that's why staff asked for the moratorium, because it's hard to keep adding and adding and adding when you're trying to create a finite number of of short term rentals. And, and remember that when we talk about a moratorium, at least if I'm hearing what I believe is a majority of council, we'll have to confirm that um, we're talking mostly about ones that. And there are some owner occupied ones that are within the 36. There are nine of the 36 that are owner occupied. So, so the, so, um, so those, I, the question is whether or not you're going to continue to allow folks to. Well, it just, it just sounds to me like order of order. The 45 would then be uh, the Potential bed and breakfast business, or I mean Airbnb business. Correct. So then, then <clears throat> well, uh, the other three quarters are because they're renting uh, out. No, to I mean, I, as, as as far as I understand, uh, the two gentlemen that had six are adding six, so that would be uh, forty-five out of forty-five. Twelve of them would. Board. No, you would be adding nine. So. So I think you're a little bit, just if I can clarify. Yeah, sure. Council, yeah. Council no, I, I'm sorry. So there are 36 <clears throat> permitted <throat> units right now. Of those 36, I think what you're talking about is the, the six that are owned by one business owner. Yeah. So, th so that's ones that are of current active permits. And there are a couple that are inactive, but really they're COVID related. So we want to include those 36. Okay. Of those 36, nine are only used as a primary residency. So that's only a quarter. The, the, the remainder of those 36, the remainder of the three-fourths are what you state, a business. They are, they are renting, they are purchasing from a business perspective. Um, it just sounded like a monopoly. It, so <laughs> then you look at the additional nine applications that have been received since the council initiated a more, or approved a moratorium. Of those nine, there are three applications from the same business owner that owns six of the original 36. So they would have nine established short-term rentals that, that is a business within the city of Sonora. So they have nine of the 40, effectively, the 40 if we so nine, of nine of the 45 or 18 yeah. percent, effectively. So the nine that we're talking about after the moratorium have not um, have not had permits or anything in the past with us. They have not, except for I will say, three submitted from the business owner that currently owns right. six. So he may but have been, he may units. or may not have been operating. Well, all nine of them may or may not have been operating, but they have not been have not registered with the city prior to that to the moratorium. That's right. For those for those three additional. Yeah, yeah. the, the permits are specific to yeah. the to the housing site. And yeah. so gotcha. So the, okay. those three places have not been specific. So I think one of the questions that we need clarification, I think we have clarification on the 36. Mm -hmm. But we don't have clarification on whether or not you want us to continue you want us to continue, continue. with processing the nine or not. Right. But whether whether you, you want to stick to open the it up more. or not. Basically, what it is is whether you want to stick to that date of the moratorium or not, right? Yeah. Okay. I understand that. May I ask? But also, I think what we need to consider is if we let those the nine in post March sixteenth, then does do we open a new moratorium mm -hmm. date? Exactly. So, yeah. And and how does that not stop? Another way you could do it is you could have 36 and then you could decide on a number and then you could do either a lottery system or you just have people submit applications and lottery. and and, yeah. and um, you pick like who you think the best operators are going to be out, out of that group. So somewhat similar to how, how we've done in other situations. Yes, other jurisdictions have done lotteries, have some members such. I forgot about lotteries. So, the, the other distinction that I think we need to make with these nine or however many there are is if it's part of their home then I, I i don't think we should restrict that i mean if it's a if they've converted a basement to a separate apartment or something like that i don't are they are they do you know what the permits are asking for i believe there's two 
two, maybe three tops that are asking for primary residency. So of the nine, three, nine. I believe there's two, three, maybe at the most. That would be a primary residency. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, there are many ways to consider this. I think, but um, and part of it is just how does it affect the neighborhood? But I think if someone has converted some part of their home into a for for the use of Airbnb rental, <clears throat> we're not they're not taking a rental property. That could be someone else's home. It's it's part of their home, and I think that there should be a, a much more lenient allowance know. of that. You don't. To agree? me, it's, to me, it seems like they're still renting it, whether they're renting it to a long term or, or they're renting it to a short term. Right, but they're not. But but they probably wouldn't make the decision to rent that space for a, as a long term rental. I mean, I might no, rent. Probably, yeah. I, I might be. I'd be much more willing to rent space. It was part of my home for, you know, rentals that I could afford, excuse me, that I could control than yeah. I would for someone who is going to live there for 20 years. What I thought it, I was that... I'm sorry. Thank, I, I'm good, Judy. Okay, I'm sorry. Then. Um, what I thought I'd mentioned envisioning or even understanding from some of the suggestions was that for those owner-occupied that we would allow those to go forward kind of without question at this point, because they're not decreasing any housing stock. They're still housed and they're going to live there whether they rent out rooms or not. And, so, uh, if I may, can, can I ask if I have direction, if I have a majority of direction to allow of the, of the nine for ones that are primary residency to go forward. However, again, then you would have to determine an additional moratorium date to stop applications from being received. Or if the council wants to continue with receiving in perpetuity applications of those that are primary residents. Uh, I'm in, frankly, I'm inclined to, to hold on the moratorium kind of straightforward until we get this all solved, um, until we have it, stuff written out and, and what we're gonna do. I mean, we're, we're talking about, the, we didn't really talk about the 1% the, the cap or whatever you wanna make a cap and, and whether that applies to unhosted rentals or hosted rentals and all that stuff. Um, I, I, I take Colette's point about it, the person that's, the two that have the, um, um, uh, that are doing it part of their house and it's I understand that part of it but I don't know I I, I think we need to to get it all down in writing before we start creeping with more terms here and there and all that so um, while we're on this subject I think we would be served if we I don't think your mic's on. Oh, I turned it off so I could cough again. Sorry about that. I okay. I, I think this is probably the best time for us to talk about if we would like to include in this ordinance making a cap, sort of a percentage of available housing stock. And and we're never going to have a perfect solution, but if we have a moratorium whenever the council decides, but sometime at a hard date, then going forward, <clears throat> as people sell those properties, move, whatever, we're gonna have a decrease in stock. And so at some point it'll be available for new things. I think this is the time to talk about whether we want 1% or something approaching the current 2% or something. And I, I have no hard and fast uh, opinions on it. I just I think that we'd be served to talk about it. So something I'll throw out there after hearing all this, and I think maybe this is where the council can agree on, but I'm not for sure. So um, is not having any moratorium on hosted uh, Airbnbs because yeah, primary residents. Yeah, primary residents. Yes. Um, just because the sheer fact is you know, the, the idea that we're talking about this was a housing shortage. 
if someone's already living in a house, they're, they're, that's not sh you know short. But again, I don't know what the rest of the council thinks, but well, to me, that's... The, 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 yeah, let, let, me, let me say something and then come on up. Uh, so you, what, they're doing, what they're doing is creating new stock, new housing stock. And so, in effect, they are creating stock, but they're creating stock, and it's going directly into um, uh, short-term rentals. It's not going into longer-term rentals. So, it there's, I mean, it's not like it's the idea that someone is already renting. They're still are already there, yes, but they're creating new stock, no matter what they're doing. My my thought process, Jim, was the fact of like Mark brought it up. He's got two bedrooms. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. he's not going to rent them out, but he's got two bedrooms. He could do an Airbnb type of thing. And that was, that's my thought process. If someone's got an extra bedroom, extra bedroom and bathroom, and they want to do that. Um, granted, they could rent out a bedroom, you know, a room for a longer period of time. But again, I, like I said, that's my opinion. I, I, I think that's a, a decent compromise. Just to let the public know, I see a hand raised. Um, for this particular item, we did uh, already finish the public comment. So there's two different types of owner occupied situations. There's one where they're renting out a room, which isn't really affecting your housing stock at all. And then there's the one where they are renting out an apartment or they wanna convert their garage into an apartment that they wanna use for Airbnb. And that's a different scenario that we are, are gonna to need to address and we probably will be bringing some of that back for you guys. So the other thing is ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Mm -hmm. The state has really tied the cities and counties on accepting those to increase housing stock. I mean, that's why they're doing it. They're not doing it because they wanna see more Airbnbs. They're doing it because they want to increase housing stock because they know the state has a housing crisis. So um, when we get, and we'll be working on our ADU ordinance. So when, so for, I understand for existing, because this is all out of the blue and people would not know. But when we start talking about new accessory dwelling units, we're gonna come in with a recommendation based on what the state law is and what the state regulations are. And it's kind of wishy-washy on that. Um, and so we need to be really careful as how we word, all of our ordinance have to work together. So when we're working with the city attorney, I just want you to keep that in mind that staff actually might recommend on our new ADUs that they not be allowed for Airbnb or certain types of ADUs if they, if they get, um, if they get a, um, they're close to the property lines or whatever it is, but that could come up. So we just need to be really careful. Coming from well. direction from the state that new ADUs generally not be looked at from a, from a short-term rental. And not only the state, but staff as well, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of opportunity to create housing in the Sonora. You're three square miles. Everything that's easy to develop has been developed. That's mm -hmm. the issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so it is a way for us to pick up rental housing. The other comment I'd like to make about the downtown and Mary Rose and I had this conversation as well. So I understand wanting your um, hotel stuff to be downtown because that's where the tourists wanna be, but you also need to realize that a lot of your low income housing rentals exist in your downtown corridor. And it, it's a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> People can, they don't have cars. Right. They can walk to anything that they need. Um, so we need to be, really careful if you designate one area of the city and then it gets inundated and then it kicks people out of some of that affordable housing stock Gentrification. versus yep. making it more citywide where it, you get a few here or there. So just keep that in mind as well um, from a housing perspective, okay? Thank you. Well, we knew it'd be a thorny issue. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the other thing too, and I'm, I'm throwing this out here because I think it's something probably the council could agree upon. And honestly, I think, from what I heard from a lot of the public, they could agree upon. Uh, Chief New had brought up the, the whole fact that most of them aren't inspected by fire and there's certain regulations. And uh, to me, you know, I think it is something that definitely needs to be put in there, you know, make sure smoke detectors and a yearly inspection. If there's people coming and going like that, I think that's something that we could probably definitely agree upon. Mm -hmm. And it's not, at least what I know about but purchasing fire equipment, because I have all that in my house, um, it's not a burdensome regulation. You know, having a carbon monoxide detector and smoke detector, 
uh, and a couple of fire extinguishers aren't burdensome regulations. It might mm -hmm. actually save the house from getting burnt down. And it should be a given anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I could make a recommendation, Mayor, just kind of listening to the, the conversation <clears throat> and kind of picking up on some of the, the things I've heard. Um, what I'd like to do is, is kind of keep it static for the, for the moment, have whatever is going to be drafted, put on the books and approved and not process the nine applicants or any new applications any further until such time as it's on the books. Only for the reason that that I would want whoever is going to be processed to be processed under the new rules, mm -hmm. and then at the time when we have that in, then you can figure out how and which way that you want to adjust it. Um, because I mean, candidly, you might get some people who like, hey, I have to have this fire inspection. Now they're going to look at this water heater that I didn't get permitted, and now I don't want to. I don't want them coming in. Now I'm not going to do this anymore. So I'd run, I'd, I'd like them to know the rules that they have to do it, taking into account you have these 36. Mm -hmm these 36 um, folks and then kind of revisit this issue of the nine applicants and the, because again, it's a little bit nuanced when we talk about, I mean, I mean, Rochelle talked a little bit about when you have a guest house or ADU versus main thing. I also worry about uh, situations where people, it's their primary residence, but they really don't ever live there. Um, right. No, and then I mean, it effectively is a way to yeah. circumvent, so. Um, yeah, that's true. So anyways, so so we, we got to work through through those issues. So that would be mm -hmm. as staff kind of your recommendation to let us get a, a good set of regulations based off of your feedback on the books so that um, people know what they're what they're looking at. And the 36 will know that they're in so long as they stay compliant. I, I do want to put it for the record that when we work with Rochelle and, and Mary Rose to draft this, if, if somebody misses their you know, doesn't renew when they get a warning letter, you got like 30 days to renew and they don't do it within that time. It would be my expectation that that grandfathering would, would lapse and go away. So, so just so we're all on the same page as to how that would, would yeah. work and why we're drafting this, it is our expectation that they would, they would stay compliant with whatever rules are currently on the books or they would lose that grandfathering ability. That would be my expectation when part of, when the, the thrust of my, the reason for wanting to even be more generous uh, is for predictability. Well, we've got predictability, and and if they then don't follow through with what would be normal business practice, if they have a lawsuit that's filed two days or two minutes too late, it's done. You just don't get it through. And I'm afraid that on this, I mean, at some point, obviously, we have to have some hard limits. And, that I think is right, reasonable, and anybody who's serious with their business will do their due diligence. And, and, so, and this is more just for the record of, the, of this meeting, but the nine applicants, they would still stay as applications with the city. It's just we wouldn't yeah. process them yeah. mm -hmm. until right. such time as, as we come back and revisit yeah. this with the council. So effectively, the moratorium yeah. is in effect. It doesn't mean that these things won't wind up being granted in in, at least in some or in whole, um, but um, but those applications just wouldn't be further processed until we got the regulations on the books mm -hmm. and yeah. in further direction. It's a question for staff, but um, if we could get these, perhaps a meeting before we're actually going to discuss them and take hard votes, so, that yeah. would be really nice because, okay, I, I like to go talk with people and there are a lot of things that I don't know about, and I get a lot of valuable feedback. And so having a little more time than a weekend for me would be really valuable. Um, um, if it's not possible, I mean, that's uh, something else. And I understand that to some degree, time is of the essence because of, I mean, the people who are waiting, the people who need the new, new, so what, what what I would propose, the staff would, um, I still would like to be able to present a draft oh, okay. um, before, I would like to present a draft to ensure that I have concurrence of, 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 of the council and then be able to present that to the community of what the council is proposing to go before the planning commission. That's far more generous than what I was asking. Okay. okay. So I it just... was the intention of staff to bring back a draft ordinance okay. based on the direction Good. given tonight in June um, yeah. with the hope that okay. then that uh, draft 
then if every interested approved, party will hear would, it and would, comment. would then go to the planning commission on and then um, come back to the council but if the council wants them would like a community meeting prior to it to go into the planning commission um if, is that the direction i'm hearing do you want it after the draft is solidified by the council so that the council agrees on what that ordinance looks like and then we have the ability to present it to the community before it goes to the planning commission I would like that. I think it would give a little more input. And, yeah, and again, I want to see. Hmm? Oh, I thought you were saying, yeah. I just, I don't know. I, I just really want people to be treated fairly and, um, you know, make sure we're all following the same rule book. So. So just so you know, it, it would, thank you. It would then push out when the planning, when it would be heard in front of the planning commission and then push out again when it would be heard in front of the city council. So I just want you to be aware of that. So I mean, what's the the staff was thinking June draft, July planning commission, mm -hmm. August but city council. So I just want you to be aware that it would push back off dates of when an ordinance would go into effect. So the other question, cause I'm gonna I'll probably get this right after this meeting is over with. Um, even though this is considered a moratorium, the city is still accepting applications, correct? So the council's direction on that moratorium was we are we are receiving applications and not processing. So just in case there is a change yes. in what the council, what the direction is coming from the council. Yes. So it's not a traditional moratorium as we would look at it. So no, but to be yeah. clear, they're all date stamps. So yeah. we can keep track of when yes. when, when things when came in and and council would have to determine whether or not they're going to, if there was a limit on how many they were going to accept, whether or not date that of receipt was was part of that determination. That that's a that's a future determ item that would need to be yeah. decided by the council. Okay. But I, I I don't want to give people the idea that this is just some kind of we're going in the opposite direction. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I just don't want a big bum rush of a hundred applicants no. all of a sudden tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah. exactly why staff recommended that because of the rush once when it once it's heard that there could be changes you're going to get a rush yep. of applications which is could potentially defeat what the council is trying to accomplish through a limitation of your short-term rental so the public heard that that is good okay so do we think we have enough direction doug to go forward with an ordinance you think we're good okay all right, so again, for the public and for the council, I will be bringing, staff will be bringing back a, an, a draft ordinance to, to, uh, to look at and to provide any additional direction in June, most likely the second meeting in June, um, because we've got budget and so forth that first meeting of June. So I just want the public to be aware there are more opportunities to comment on this as we go along in the process. Excellent, okay. Thank you. I uh, just want to thank all of the public for commenting. I it's it's really good to have people talking and I'm getting tired. So we're going to go to on number 14 consideration to appoint a member of the public to the social equity committee. Yeah. Council member such. Um, actually, just at you. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you can call me after. Sorry. <laughs> So um, the item before you um, is a request to um, allow for a, an appointment of a community member to your social equity committee. Uh, as you recall, in September, the council voted to approve the following members based on your um, agenda report um, to your social equity committee. Uh, council directed staff to allow for a representative of, of each council member. So every, each committee member is a is chosen and represented by a council member, uh, obviously with ratification of a majority of the council. Uh, in January 2021, committee member Sylvia Roberts submitted her resignation to council member Such. Council member Such would like to select another member of the public to replace Ms. Roberts. As per the city council handbook, a member can only be appointed once an application has been received and the applicant is ratified by a majority of the council. So we are asking direction from the council uh, in choosing a new committee member to represent the social equity committee. There are two options in which the council can um, direct staff to do this. Um, that is, we currently we currently have on file 12 applications 
from your original application period. The council could direct staff to look at those, those applications received back in September to select, or we can open the application process again, determine a deadline and choose from those additional applications received. Normally staff, when they open an application process from the community, we generally wait 30 days to give more than enough input from community members to submit an application. Um, but it's whatever the discretion of the council, obviously this would be chosen member from council member such with ratification from the, the majority of the council. I see it only 11, I don't see 12, but am I? Was it 11? I'm so sorry, it's getting late in the night. It's all right. So we received 12 applications to serve on the committee by an applicant. Yeah, in the, in the, I believe we received 12. Well, if I look at the original list, it's 11. I mean, I printed it and read all the applications again, unless there was one that wasn't on this original list. I will make sure that we verify that number. Correctly. Anyhow, that, I mean, that's, um, so, uh, you know, I should have brought this up a long time ago. There were a few times I wanted to, but there, I, oh, this is on, sorry. But it felt like the social equity, there was consideration about whether uh, social equity, the social equity committee was going to move forward or not. And I didn't want to bring someone in under those conditions. <clears throat> After the um, last um, discussion about this with council, um, I decided the time is right to, to bring another person on. Um, I actually spoke to Sylvia Roberts just to see if she had any recommendations about this. My, my choice certainly would be to open this process up again. Um, I think the, um, um, the social equity committee has evolved and it's a different, the whole process is different really than, than when we, before we began. So my, my strong recommendation is that we open this application process up again. I would like to not have it be a 30 day uh, period, however, because I think that there are a lot of people who have been part of this process just, and par participated in this process. And I don't, um, I, I would prefer someone who has been watching these meetings and participating in them because oh, otherwise it's going to be tough for someone to integrate into this group and hit, be able to hit the ground running. So that's it from me at, for, at, for, for now. Any other council members want to comment? Yeah, I, 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 that that's fine. I just think that the, the previous application should be part of the just to be automatically looked at and be part of it. There's the, we got two options. One said that the for the previous applications or open a new set. I, I you know I know over the county if you apply for something that's on file for two years. I and then they do it. I think I don't know if we have that policy, but certainly in this regard, I, I totally think, agree. I think that the those that already applied that are not put on have been on already should be part of the um, package and then would be looked at and then with the additional. Yeah. I actually my plan um, would if if this can be opened up is that I will call every single person that is not on the committee but applied in that first group and interview all of them. Oh, okay, there you that's go. just yep. to yep. just to see if they're still interested to see yep. what you know just to to see how they're feeling. Um, absolutely. I, I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. <clears throat> yeah, as long as, I mean, my opinion is as long as we're, we're offering it to the ones that did apply, and then since this would be a new appoint, a new appointment, then it would open it up to others. Because I, I, again, I got calls. Some of them probably, you know, you may not be as happy if they were on the social equity committee, uh, but they were people of color. And they wanted to be on the committee. So again, I, I I got calls from people that wanted to apply. So yeah, I, I, I think it's great. I was just gonna say that, um, that there's been enough um, uh, public viewing and, and participation in the committee that it's much better um, known. And I think that you'll get an, um, a, an array of new um, interested mm. parties as well as the uh, former uh, applicants. 
well, I'll take my role as flying the ointment. And I think that the committee, this very divisive committee should finish up their work and then be put to bed. Uh, uh, the lady who took me to task for what partisans look like had a, had a point. And I apologize for that. But when I listen to them, I know Democrat talking points when I hear them. And that's what this committee sounds like. Um, uh, it is divisive for people who, I mean, the, the group who listens to it are, I don't know people's political party in, of choice, but I know when they sound progressive and have certain interests. And I would like to see this taken care of and then be put to bed. I, if, it, if it has the popular appeal that it seems to in certain groups, then it ought to be made a committee of the, of the local Democratic Party chairs and, and go that direction. But I don't think that the city council is the place for this longer. And I'm done. Okay. So from a direction standpoint, I'm hearing that we want to open up to allow for the selection of a member to include both the former application and it would be staff's recommendations that we hold it open for three weeks because it is precedent that we generally hold open applications for 30 days um, for all applications received to committees. So I, I would rec it would be a staff recommendation that we do it no less than three weeks. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure this is probably where you and I are gonna disagree, but I, I, I think that's the, probably the right thing to do. Well, I, you know, it's just that there's a lot of work being done right now. And if we leave it, have it open for three weeks, then I review the applications and then I interview all the people and then it has to come back to council. I mean, it's gonna be over before. I, I just I just don't, I think there's time is actually a, is, is an issue. If you know someone who is interested in the committee, you know, I mean, people can reach out. If, the, if people don't know that it's been, excuse me, I'm sorry, I forgot to speak into the microphone. I've been trying. <laughs> um, if people don't know that this is going on, they haven't really been paying very close attention, I think. And certainly everyone can reach out to people in the community they, who, who were, were interested, um, but didn't apply before, or who are interested now to get them to apply. But I think, I mean, I would choose two weeks because I think otherwise it's, it's very delayed and almost makes it non, uh, not helpful. So. Okay. Um, so I guess we give the direction, we need to give direction. So we, I guess we've got to find some sort of consensus. So I'm confused. And, and admittedly so. Um, so what, what is the bone of contention? The bone of contention is whether there's not an appointment by the, in two weeks. How, how long? The well, that, well, that would, wouldn't that be the, the gist of it though, that you want to appoint, have someone appointed by the next meeting, council meeting? I would like to have, bring someone to the next council meeting. I don't know if that's actually possible. Actually. No, yeah, that's, not, that's possible. not possible. Yeah. 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 That's not yeah, possible. I don't, I don't think that's fair. So, so if it's in, in a month, then it four weeks, three. then. Then three weeks works. Yeah. Okay. Three weeks work. You're right. I thought I did the math earlier today on this, but obviously I okay. can't. Then I think we've. Go with yeah. three weeks. Okay, I've got the direction right. for that. Yeah, I am no longer confused. <laughs> and you would have just said yes to anything. <laughs> and that's, you don't need a motion on that. That's I do just, not need a motion, just, just need a direction. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So oh, any oh, public oh, yeah, comment? Yeah, yeah. Oh, excuse me. Oh, any public comment on that item? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, there is comment from Karen Wood. Okay, go ahead, Karen. 
I just have to say I'm really disappointed to hear a council member who's been elected to represent the people of Sonora say that a committee that is all about making sure all voices are heard is a partisan issue. It, this is not a partisan issue. Racism is not a partisan issue. Discrimination is not a partisan issue. This is a humanity issue. And to have an elected official not care about making sure that all voices are heard and represented is unbelievable, disgusting. And I, I mean, it's just, this is supposed to be a nonpartisan council. Clearly, Councilman Plummer is very partisan and does not care about making sure that all voices in this community are heard and making sure that racism is addressed. As a white man to stand up and say he doesn't see racism, I could file in the number of people you wouldn't believe that have experienced racism. Just yesterday, I was speaking to a man who was threatened at one of our rivers because he was black. You don't know what the hell you're talking about around racism and to not care and wanting to disband social equity, you should not be representing our city. It is wrong. Okay. Um, Your next public comment is from Pablo Lopez. Okay, go ahead, Pablo. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's important to kind of give some context as to like what social equity is, right? Um, social equity is this idea of justice and fairness, specifically in social policy, right? Social equity has to go through public administration. Um, so I mean, the idea- Hello, to I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna just, so the, the topic for um, the agendized topic, which your comments have to be Thank restricted to, are to the appointment of a member of the social equity committee. It's not to the social equity committee in general. So you have to limit your comments to the, to, to the appointment process. Okay, fair. I was just responding to um, Mayor Pro Temp, um, but sure, yeah. Uh, within the within the context of of the social equity committee and the appointments, I think also moving forward, um, I I understand that there's a process and that it needs to be kept, um, you know, within the fairness. But uh, going to the point of uh, Council Member Collette Such. It is, I think, a requirement, uh, given the context of the difficulties that the committee is seeing in moving forward, um, time is of the essence and kind of getting somebody in that, you know, uh, represents more people, specifically more people of color or specifically um, people with different gender or sexual identities. So um, going on that point, um, I think it's really telling the, com the complex issues that are happening in Sonora, right? The insane resistance uh, about something that is so, so commonplace and looking at, you know, uh, potential candidates should be looked at with the idea that that resistance exists and it should be done, you know, an appointment should be done quickly, uh, but thoughtfully. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let me, so let me just reiterate. So the pu public comment is limited to the appointment process for the social equity committee. It's not, it's, it's not a free for all to debate the social equity committee in general. Your next public comment is from Megan Mills. Go ahead, Megan. Hi, thank you for taking my comment. The appointment process should be transparent and done quickly and thoughtfully, as Pablo just said. And I also have to echo the sentiment that it is inappropriate for an elected official to claim this is a partisan yeah. issue. Again, and it's so apparent so, that that partisan is interfering with the ability to govern. And so with the appointment okay, process- we're, We are talking start. about just the appointment process. Yes, the appointment process needs to be looked at through a social equity lens. And that is by all members of the council. And if someone's personal politics interfere with that process, that is that that should not happen. That is interfering with the process of social equity. And if that's a partisan issue, then what does that say about the other party or other parties? Okay, thank you. Your next public comment is from Elizabeth. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? All right, thank you. 
I thank you for taking my call, and I want to say that uh, the the uh, selecting a new member for the social equity committee must be transparent. It is not a partisan issue, and the people who are on it should not be partisan because racism is not partisan. It is a very real problem in our community, and the council has agreed to this uh, creating this committee. It needs to stick with it and not to bed. Thank you very much for taking my call. Thank you. Your next public comment is from a phone line with the last four digits of 5354. Please dial star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm uh, wondering if <clears throat> uh, last time around you limited it to people within the county if someone works within or perhaps for the city, if that uh, could be waived for somebody like lives in Calaveras? Um, the requirements, oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Your current okay. re application uh, requirements. Re yeah, go, go ahead and finish and then we'll, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Okay, your current uh, application process requires that a person live within the county. I was wondering if someone works within the city or perhaps for the city, if you could waive the requirement to live within the county and uh, allow people that like work in or for the city to uh, live in another county like Calaveras. Okay. okay, so now, okay, so he is done and then there's no one else. There is another hand. Oh, no other hands. Okay. Um, right now, the current um, uh, qualification rule is that they have to live in Tuolumne County. Mm -hmm. And that was actually an expansion on what had happened. And usually most groups, uh, committees that the city does, you have to live inside the city limits of Sonora. Uh, we actually expanded it to the county of Tuolumne. And we're not agenda, so we couldn't change the rules yeah, tonight. Yeah, there's, there's nothing. At least we can answer that question. But yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting really tired. I should be in bed. <laughs> so, okay. So we've already given direction. Um, no other direction coming from any council members? Nothing's changed for me, though. No. Okay. Okay. So that part we have taken care of. So, um, okay, so we'll go to department head reports. Uh, our police chief, Vanderweel. Thank you. Thank you. Chief New, our fire chief. <laughs> uh, item, and that is that tomorrow, May 4th, is uh, International Firefighters Day. And just wanted to bring that to the council and public's attention. Um, this day actually was born out of a tragic loss in Victoria, Australia, where five firefighters lost their lives in a wildland fire. Uh, Australia said it was a way to honor their lives and sacrifices of the firefighters and are willing to make for you and me on a daily basis. The day of recognition is celebrated on May 4th and is at the core of what the National Firefighters Foundation establishes and does. The mission is to honor and remember Americans fallen firefighters and assist their families in rebuilding their lives to prevent firefighter injuries and deaths. So uh, if you could join a time tomorrow, or if you have a red light, they say to light up your neighborhood with a red light bulb uh, for International Firefighters Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our community development director, Michelle Kellogg. For those of you, I'm not sure um, who knew her, um, but um, Mayor Liz Bass passed away yesterday. Um, so I just want to let you guys know that she has passed away. Um, I got a, a message that said that she had passed away. So, wow. So, yeah, we were we we were, were trying to confirm that. We were trying to sure. confirm that before we announced. Oh yeah, no, she has. She yeah. passed away. Son. Yes. So at the at the next council meeting, yeah. um, well, when we hopefully have a lot of people, I'd like to do a moment of silence. She was the first uh, mayor, first female mayor, first female mayor, 
And, you know, she's, she was really cool. I was uh, talking to David Goldenberg about her and she really reached out and I really liked how she did things. Didn't always agree with her politics, but I really liked how she reached out to everyone. So. And then the farmer's market starts on the 15th. So we're um, a week from Saturday. So just to let you guys know that. And we are starting the uh, planning for Magic of the Night, which will be on August 8th or August 6th. It's the first Friday night in August. So uh, we'll be moving forward um, as we have in the past with that event. So I just want to let you guys know. Excellent. Thank you. Finance Director, Chris Gorski. Uh, okay. <laughs> Our City Attorney, Doug White. Nothing tonight. Okay. City Administrator. Are you ready? Just a couple of quick things. Um, the Vision Sonora application packet uh, for those that would like to serve as a member of the public, uh, which requires city residency, it is available on our website. The deadline for that application is May 25th. Um, and then also, um, I hope everybody got to see the recent article in the Union Democrat about May 1st. Um, was the city of Sonora's 170th year of incorporation. Um, and it was kind of unfortunate with a year of COVID, we really didn't have any opportunity to plan a big celebration, but we are planning to plan um, a big 175th anniversary when that comes up in the next five years. Um, but just a couple of quick things about Sonora as we look at, um, reflect back on the 170 years of our incorporation. Sonora is one of the oldest cities in California and was incorporated on May 1st, 1851. Only 10 cities have been longer, uh, incorporated longer. Sonora was historically referred to as the queen of the Southern mines. And um, <clears throat> Sonora's prosperity during the late 1800s and early 1900s is evidenced by many of the historical homes and buildings as we see treasured today in our downtown area. And so we can look with great pride at this transformation from a county town to a small vital city that provides a way of life and enjoyment by other communities and is still queen of the Southern mind. So we apologize. We really wanted to provide some sort of celebration for the 170th year. It's just with COVID, it's been quite difficult to plan um, celebrations in this year. Um, but I urge all council members to look at the well done article in the Union Democrat that, um, that celebrated uh, Sonora's 170th year. Cool. Okay, um, Councilmember Sagerstrom. Oh, good. I work. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's getting trained. That's good. Yes. Um, yeah, I um, attended the Sonora um, Chamber of Commerce mixer. Um, gosh, I don't know. Was it? Oh, anyway, it was um, after the last meeting, and they did. Um, they uh, toured the. Uh, the low power radio station, KAAD. And um, that was really fascinating. I mean, I, I had no idea about the capacity of that, uh, of that station and all the volunteers that, that work there and broadcast their programs. And uh, so it was, it was just really informative and also very exciting about um, the programs they have there. And they also have a, um, a radio production program for the Casina High Streets. So, um, you know, I'm tuning in more often. Um, I went, uh, did a uh, mayor's and council members roundtable from the League of Cities. Uh, it was um, mostly about disaster preparation. And they did talk about the Firewise program. Um, David Goldenberg has also um, done a presentation about that. And there was, there was some interesting things that some of the cities are doing. They have a, a one city has a city alert system for their residents. Um, that you know goes directly to uh, 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 registered phones. Also, is bilingual. Um, so that also offers other you know other resource um, um, uh, information. You know where to where to look for you know fire information, evacuation information, all that kind of things. The other thing I thought was really interesting. Um, one city offered evacuation tags. So if you've left your home, you tag the door. So the first responders know they don't have to worry that anyone's there, that you and your animals. I, I thought it was really a brilliant idea. It could be very easy. Um, and, you know, while uh, community wildfire protection plans um, and of course, firewise uh, committees. And then the uh, California cities uh, actually has a seven part series on preparing for fire um, on their website. So um, some, you know, uh, we might want to look at that at some point. 
Um, I did the Love Tuolumne County graffiti cleanup downtown. It was really fun and uh, Stewart Street looks great. And uh, the Energy Action Committee met and um, they've changed their meeting time to the fourth Wednesday of the month at 2 p.m. as Supervisor Goldenberg is joining and as more convenient for him. And also um, they had some um, changes that they wanted to make to the city website in terms of links and of course the meeting date. So if you could let me know how to do that, I will, um, I will get the information. So that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Garaventa. Uh, nothing, nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Council Member Such. Yeah, the last your mic's on. Sorry, I, I actually uh, didn't do very much, I don't think, between the last meeting. Um, I was supposed to, uh, on Saturday before last, to, go, to participate in the Love Tuolumne cleanup for Resiliency Village, but it had to be canceled because they're still in escrow. Um, and I did attend David Goldenberg's Firewise Community um, um, program and and really interesting but that's it okay for me okay thank you uh council member or sorry mayor pro tem mark Plummer. thank you nothing of any great import at this point okay so pretty much all i've got is what looks like we're going to be going into a interesting fire season the the news and the science is out there so if you have a chance to clear some or all of your property in the right way, please do it because I think things are gonna get dry here real quick and you never know, you might save your own house or your neighbors. So that is all I have. And I thank everyone for a great night.